afternoon, Council. We're ready to get started. I'll call our August 16th work session to order. Good afternoon, David. I'll turn it over to you. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you, thank you. All right, as for upcoming events, our first public engagement on the budget is tomorrow night, Wednesday, August 17th, beginning at 6 p.m., Summer Glen Library on Basswood. Come join us if you'd like. Six o'clock tomorrow night. Next, I'm going to call on uh, Council Member Crane, and he's going to recognize an officer. Sure. Council Member. Yeah, thank you, David. Uh, I'd like to, I, I, I love telling good stories. So, Officer Spragans, would you group? Yeah, y'all come on up. Um, I don't think that we give attention a lot of times when people do really great things. And I, this is a good example of why I'm very supportive of our NPO program, what they're doing. So this is Officer Spraggs. He's coming up with Tony. Tony, Tony is a veteran uh, who was homeless that Officer Spraggs met out on the street. Um, and I, I do think you went above and beyond what you're called to do to find him a home, to find him the resources that he needed. And um, you know, up there with him is Bobby and Peggy Kretzinger, who, who own Operation Texas Strong. It's a Weatherford organization, but they, um, their goal is to get homeless vets off the streets. So they, I understand that as of today, you've given 103 RVs out, 102 RVs out, <laughs> be 103 soon, to house our homeless veterans, as we know that housing is an issue here across the board, and especially for those that have served us in some capacity. So I want to say thank you, and, and I will give you the floor just to tell us a little bit about your operations and, and Officer Spragans, uh, how, how it all came together. Thank you very much, Councilman Crane. Appreciate this opportunity to share this story further, because the whole point is to get te Operation Texas Strong better known, because I didn't know about it. And when I met this young man in a Walmart parking lot and started to learn his story. He's the one that found them and told me about it. So the rest is history. So when I got in contact with Bobby, they bent over backwards to help, told me about the RV down in um, Granbury. So <laughs> that was a long tow. But now Tony here is back on his feet. Hopefully it's been life changing for him. And I think Tony, who's originally from Alabama, has seen the Texas hospitality <laughs> tenfold. So I keep telling them, welcome awesome. to Texas. For Absolutely. sure. <laughs> <laughs> These are some pictures up here. Bobby, I don't know if you have any, uh, or Tony, you want to talk and explanation a little bit about how it came together? Yeah, sure. Because I know I got a minute, right? <laughs> <laughs> I could talk really fast in a minute. So I gave it, we gave away God's, God has shown us what we need to do to fix the homeless veteran programs. And we are not stretching no city money no county money no nothing it's all private funded people do donations um as of right now i do have 500 dollars in my bank account to move rvs but i spent 1200 dollars this weekend to move two of them so but i'll make it short short we do need more help we would like to invite the city and anybody that would like to help us get rvs donated we need more rvs and we have a list as of right now i've had 110 calls in the last hour and a half uh, we did a newscast, Channel 4 News, today, this morning, on a short notice and live video. I've never done that before. But, okay, I see. There's my minute. Thank you. No, it's <laughs> <laughs> our, our, whole, our whole goal in Operation Texas Strong is to get as many veterans off of the street, um, living in the elements. Um, we, we can do more work when we have help with the community instead of we we try to do this on private and, and private funding private everything so that way everybody can understand how we feel because there's one thing veterans should never be on the street and our goal is and our and our way of feeling is as a veteran's daughter and um, these people have fought for our our, our rights and so we couldn't figure anything better than to give back that way and we've done 102 in one year wow, wow. so can you imagine next by next year our goal is supposed to be 300 to 400 um from what i know is over 22,000 homeless veterans in texas um just in fort worth and dallas dfw there's 5,000. Wow. Uh, the reason i know that because we have people that feed everybody every day uh, we have other groups that feed, which are, we're part of other nonprofits that help. And I do collect stuff for the RVs, so they can send it to my house. 
you can look at my Facebook page. We do have an office and a house, my personal house. Um, I'm pretty vocal about everything I do. I apologize, but I am. Thank you. So, <laughs> I Yeah, please. First, I just want to say thank you so very much for what you do. That's really important. Um, our Directions Home staff will tell you that the hardest population to find housing for um, are often our veterans for a myriad of reasons. So thank you for providing uh, a, a type of housing that is conducive uh, to some of the unique issues that, that pose those housing um, solutions or impediments to housing solutions for our veterans. So thank you so much for doing that. I would also say that if you have a website, um, I would encourage you to tell everybody now that you have that microphone and it's being um, brought uh, and, your, and your Facebook page. And, 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 and can we make um, donations there as well? Yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you. Uh, we did have a building donated today. It's between Fort Worth and Lake Worth. It is a old nursing home, and I'm going to look at it at 3 p.m. today. And I want, to, I want it to be called Operation Texas Strong Rebuild Program for Veterans. I want it a six-month turnaround rate. That's all you have. You have six months. So after you leave the program, we have find another location for you. You buy your own property in the state of Texas. So that's my other goal. Thank you. Thank you all very much for coming. I don't, have you all connected? Have you connected with Antara Perez at all, Michael, already? I, no, I don't. We'll make sure and connect you with our staff. And um, there's been a significant investment both from the city of Fort Worth and then as of today, Tarrant County, and specifically around homelessness. So we need to make sure you're plugged in with, with, both, of, with both of our organizations um, for more information. Thank you. Yes, please. Please pass it on. Thank and you. contact Joey, too, because I kind of, like, recruited him because I, he's done an amazing <laughs> job with this veteran. So Joey doesn't have enough to do, right? Yeah, I love right. this. This is awesome. <laughs> he's a Fort Worth cop. No. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> no, but seriously, on the police side of it, this couldn't have been any easier. It was ridiculously easy to get this homeless veteran off the street. It took some phone calls. Well, it took and your time, and it took you it took having the heart time, to put to other officers out there. Use them as a resource. Look into it at least because yeah. it's super yeah. simple. Thank you so much. Appreciate you your time. Thank, thank you all too. That was a great story, wasn't it? So I got to move up here. I get to uh, make a couple introductions that I'm thrilled and excited about. Even though they've already been on the job a whole week, I think it's time to formally introduce the two new assistant city managers that have joined our team. Um, that was after a national search. I'm going to ask them both to come up here, William Johnson, Jessica McAckern. Practice that one. So you stand right here. There we go. For, you guys know William. William joined the city back in 2019. He's been our transportation and public works director. Uh, but he's got a lot more background and experience in a number of other areas, right? He's got solid waste experience. He's got emergency management experience. He's worked in three other large cities, Philadelphia, Baltimore, and Atlanta. So we're thrilled to now add him as one of the assistant city managers here in Fort Worth. Jessica is from the area, originally from Arlington, right? Mm -hmm. So we'll just say South Fort Worth, South, <laughs> Southeast Fort Worth. Uh, spent the previous four years in, as an assistant city manager in Lubbock, Texas. Before that, she was city manager of Bridgeport, Texas. It's got private sector experience. They both have private sector experience. Uh, and we're delighted to add Jessica to the team as well. She goes by Jess, not Jessica. She told me if you say Jessica, it's like her mom yelling at her. All right, now, so far, we're not entirely through. It's one weekend, but we've given Jessica Parks and Recreation. It's without Richard right now. <laughs> Libraries and Human Resources. And William's got Transportation Public Works, Public Events, and Economic Development. We'll keep looking at how we shift work around. 
but I'm delighted to welcome them to the team. And I am told them they both have an hour, no more than an hour, to tell us what it's like to now be here a week. All right, you too. Mayor and Council, it is truly a privilege to be before you today um, and joining what I would call home for me. Uh, my entire life has been spent in and around Fort Worth. My entire family is still here in and around Fort Worth. So um, it is a dream come true to continue my professional career and something that I absolutely love, which is public service, working with our residents daily to make their lives better. Um, to, to come home and fulfill that passion for me is just an, a tremendous honor. The staff here has been extremely welcoming from day one. You all have been so welcoming, and I am very appreciative for that. Um, I, I just I feel like I've been here forever already, um, although I still have a lot to learn and get up to speed. So I look forward to working with you in the future and continuing to make Fort Worth an amazing community that it already is today. So thank you. Mayor and Council, um, first I'd like to start by thanking each of you for all your support. And my, when I moved here uh, three years ago, uh, I found Fort Worth to be a place that just felt like home. And since I've been here, I've had nothing but your strong support, the support of our city manager and our city, city management team, and most of all, have really been able to build a really strong supportive team in TPW. So I want to start by thanking Lauren for stepping in as our interim TPW director. You all know Lauren, right? And her team uh, for making it possible for me to be able to move, because I don't think David would have allowed that to happen if we weren't ready with a strong team to backfill. Um, and I, I, I want to thank David for uh, his expression of confidence in allowing me to take on this role. I'm excited to work with each of you and all of the other city departments as we continue to move forward trying to make Fort Worth a better place for all and for, for all of its citizens and taking on all the challenges that we have and opportunities. Thank you. Thank you for letting me do that. Now we get to jump into informal reports. The first one is on community center management. That's both neighborhood centers and parks and recreation centers. And we have Victor Turner and Dave Lewis, if there are any questions. Uh, no questions or comment. I asked for this, and I think it was really good for me to understand um, sort of the history behind it. The other part that was missing from that was um, how we are going to address this in the budget and maybe looking at the budget moving forward. So we don't need to do anything here today, but of the, 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 the summer programs and how those are run and subsidized and what that looks like. Good question. We have that actually scheduled for the next budget work session. Yeah. All right. The next informal report is a follow-up on the dredging of ponds and lakes and parks. And again, Dave Lewis is available if there are any questions. Do we have any questions? Third is an informal report on historic cemeteries in Fort Worth. And Justin Newhart is available if there are any questions. I'd like for him to have some remarks, summary. All right. Justin, come on up. Hey, how are you? What can you tell us? About historic cemeteries? Mm -hmm. uh, we have quite Okay, I won't trick you that way. <laughs> we have, uh, in District 5, my district has two, at least two historic cemeteries. One houses the remains of African slaves, and the other houses the remains of Confederate soldiers. And in case y'all didn't know that, they're about probably one thirty seventh of a mile up. They're within walking distance. So can you talk about those two and what needs to be done? Um, you know, all of the cemeteries, including those in Fort Worth, are privately owned. And so the maintenance and upkeep of those cemeteries are on the property owners. Um, unfortunately, and this isn't just a Fort Worth problem, maintenance and upkeep and funding maintenance and upkeep is a um, nationwide problem for historic cemeteries. So um, local designation or national designation can raise awareness and also make cemeteries available for more grant funds to help with those maintenance and upkeep projects. So we're here to help if they're interested. 
They are, and I see this as an economic opportunity. I see it as a, a location for possibly museum, joint museum, separate museum, what have you. So can I have people call you? Yes, they, they've already called, so. <laughs> well, I saw your eyes get this big. I, I didn't want to throw you that far off, off guard, but thank you. You, you were released. Wait, yeah, thank thank you. you. Before you go, Justin, first of all, um, if y'all don't know, Justin is a new daddy to two new twins, so I want to make sure everybody knows that and says, yes. Um, thank you. Uh, but um, I really appreciate you putting this together. And so the impetus of, for this particular IR came from discussions I had with people um, that are the caretakers of the Pioneers Rest Cemetery, um, which is very significant to our community. And I think very much in the same way uh, that the cemeteries Gina mentioned were are also incredibly significant. Um, and we do have at least in that particular situation, a uh, group of people that are really committed to making sure that we maintain those particular grounds, although I think they could probably use some help. And that's really why I wanted us to be able to get a handle on what we had in the city and what, um, what really needs some intervention from us to make sure that we're protecting in a significant way. Um, so do they have a local designation? as a historic landmark? Do they have a state designation? Do they have a national designation? And I know you're a little short on your shop right now, but um, I'd like to see us move forward in selecting which of those don't have them and what we can do to make sure they do for funding purposes and to help us maintain that, you know, pieces of history for our community. Sure. Yeah, Thank we you. Can do that. Thank you, Justin. The next informal report is monthly development activity reports, and Jennifer Roberts is available if there are any questions. The, uh, I think Jennifer or DJ has gotten off the last couple of uh, Here's DJ. Months, Come so on up here, DJ. I do. I just want to, uh, after looking through these June, July, just trends that you're seeing, new housing starts, you know, uh, new commercial starts, what's that looking like for the city? I think there's a lot of angst, et cetera, interest rates going up, what's happening. But what do we see from this data here? Well, the indicators have all been inclusive, right? Um, for instance, over the summer months, June and July, we were just under 700 single family uh, residences those months, uh, commercials hovering around 125, 120. Uh, each month, right? This is a little bit down from the spring where we were seeing like 800 plus permits, but it, to keep it in perspective, back in 19, before we seen these surges, we were averaging about 400 single family residents and about 60 commercials a month, right? And so we're still way up on that. Uh, looking at, um, you know, applications that have come in uh, in July, they're a bit down. However, when we look at the other indicators such as plat applications, they're way up, right? So plats, you know, typically lead to building permits in the future. So that indicator says that we're going to continue going. Our, our community facilities agreements, which is the way we build the infrastructure necessary for those plats, they're continuing to to soar as well. So I mean, all things look like we'll be continuing this through the fall. This growth. Yes, sir. Um, okay. I just, thank you. I just want to thank you. Thank you. Before before you can leave the podium. Just a general question, uh, maybe maybe similar along the lines of maybe situations that you're observing at your staff level. Mm -hmm. Do do we have any deficiencies in staffing at all in your department currently? Well, we we um, with with these kind of volumes, right? And those even of 2019, um, you know, we we normally in the past been very conservative, you know, because we don't want to hire a bunch of staff and have to turn around and have layoffs or, you know, you know, have people sitting around. We want to be, you know, very cautious with the tax dollar and, and the fees that we collect. Um, so, so, but David so graciously has agreed to, uh, to allow us to kind of staff up to where we think 19 levels should have been. And so that's going to be a, a, a big help to the development services department as far as getting things out the door. Uh, additionally, what we've also done is we've created an additional division, which will be solely concentrated on customer service and the customer experience and moving things from one department to another to get things out the door. Um, so, so we're allowed, you know, we're able to give much more focus in the coming um, uh, fiscal year 
to that whole customer experience with the additional APs that we've requested in the budget and, you know, the additional division that we're creating. Okay. So that's in works right now, you're saying. Okay. It might, might go to answering a question, and you and I can talk about this offline. I've gotten feedback from both the residential side of things and the commercial side of things in as far as uh, the support they're getting from development services. So we'll talk about that uh, later because I think it's important that, uh, that you get that feedback and then um, contextualize it for me. Yes, so, you know, beyond just merely asking a general question of, do you have enough people? Or, you know, do we have a process, you know, that needs to be revisited? Yes, sir. Along those lines, you know, maybe that's what we can uh, arrive at. So, thank you. One, one more thing I'll tell you about, since you brought up process, another change that we've just made, we've just hired a uh, Black Belt Lean Six Sigma within the department to look at all of our processes to make sure that we're streamlining where we can uh, to, to make things go faster and more efficient, you know, across departments, not just the development services department. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, DJ. Next informal report is a parental leave update, and Deanna Giordano is available if there are any questions. I have several questions. Deanna probably anticipated that. Deanna, thank you for putting this together with your team. I greatly appreciate it. Um, and compliments to you. And I had you sit down or reintroduce to Best Place for Working Parents and the work that they're doing. They were very complimentary, both of our, um, our current leave policy um, and potential. So I, I put out there in the universe that I think we should try to strive towards 12 weeks of leave, um, especially in a highly competitive environment. I found your report to be very helpful. Um, I might push back a little bit on the usage of the term loss of productivity. I don't know we equate things in dollars, um, but if you look across the country and understand when you have sound leave policies, you have an 89% retention rate with those employees in many settings. And I know you know all these things. I'm just putting that out as to why I think this is so important moving forward. Um, a few high-level things I want us to consider as a council as we work with David um, and a decision to maybe extend benefits is I know it does cost the city money. Um, I understand that. But thinking about long term, especially when you think about our sworn police officers and firefighters and the need to attract more women, especially into those fields, I promise you this is something that they're looking at. Um, I, for one, don't think I could come back six weeks after giving, giving birth and putting on a bulletproof vest and Kevlar and doing my job as a police officer. I just don't think it's enough time. I also know that currently right now, I'm getting to a question, I promise, Deanna. I also know that right now um, we do treat women women. women men and women the same under FMLA policy. That's totally fine. I'm kind of curious um, if we're packaging correctly the opportunity for short-term disability or other things, especially for the birthing parent, the birthing mother in this situation, to extend additional time beyond what could be available to them right now. And then lastly, as a former city employee myself, I think sometimes the way we message this um, and available benefit is important. And I would like to work with your office on maybe repackaging this in a way to make sure everyone's really aware of the benefit. Some of the percentages were a little concerning to me about people that maybe weren't utilizing the full six weeks that available to them, and especially if we move to 12 weeks, the reason why we're offering that and why we value them as an employee. So my questions are the following. Um, the first would be, in page two of our policy, you currently define eligibility as a spouse um, for eligibility. I'm curious about cohabitation, especially if they are on the birth certificate um, and if they are currently employed by the city of Fort Worth and eligible for type of leave, other types of leave. Um, legal can come back to me on what the requirements would be there, but I am curious about that issue. If you have anything to add, go ahead, Deanna. No, I think we can certainly explore the way it's currently written. Either our practice is that we expand, extend it to those that, as you described, kind of the, the uh, co-parents that are identified for okay. adoption or Foster okay, care. that's helpful. Um, and then the other question really pertained to, let me pull this back up for you just a second. Um, bear with me here. So I think the average was, it, it, in, the, in the language it said 4.2 weeks out of six week benefits for female employees is listed on page two. But when you look at the chart, it says 4.2 average for works by employee. Mm -hmm. um, I'm really curious on the data per person and how that's being utilized. I think that comes back to how we're communicating to employees or departments 
um, and making sure that the full six weeks is el that they're eligible for are being utilized and there's not some kind of pressure at work that's pulling them back into the workplace too soon. I know how short staffed people are, but just making their use, make sure they're using those um, benefits as well. And I can tell you as we gathered this data to pro provide this updated um, IR, we also identified the need to make sure that we were communicating it to all of the individuals that are impacted by the need for such a benefit. We also know that the time frame that we picked, there were individuals that were in the middle of utilizing the parental leave, so it doesn't give you the full picture. And so there were a number of other factors that affected that. I think the other piece, because um, I also said the same thing, right? I don't know that I could come back to work in a desk job yeah. after six weeks of, after giving birth. So we want to make sure that it gets, this information gets into the hands of the individuals that are utilizing it. So we're looking at communications at the onset of need for FMLA leave or leave related, related to birth, placement, adoption, foster care that we're sharing uh, with our HRCs that are out in the departments, this information. So people are getting the full benefit that we hope them to achieve to receive. Yeah. Um, and so I think for this council, importantly, we're not making a decision today necessarily on the opportunity to extend leave from six weeks to 12. That's still a discussion we need to have with management. And we'll come back to that. So please provide me and David your input into where you think that's a good direction or a bad direction. I know there's a cost associated, but I can tell you every department right now wants to attract and retain top talent. And this is a conversation that every company is having. And I want us to be at the forefront of that innovation um, in this space. And I can personally tell you it makes a huge difference having had a baby while I was at the city of Fort Worth. Um, I, was, I was afforded eight weeks and I cobbled together vacation time only to find out we did not have um, paternal, leave, uh, maternal or paternal leave at the time. So we've come a long way and I really appreciate David's leadership and listening and working with Mayor Price at the time to get us to this place. But I'm done having babies so I can talk about this um, <laughs> on the record with that. So yeah. <laughs> We'll, we'll certainly explore options for consideration as well with some parameters that we'd like to identify um, to continue utilization and promote it in the workforce. I think you saw there, we have a very a young, tenured population of employees, and those tend to be the biggest users mm -hmm. of the parental leave, so we want to make sure that we're meeting their needs. Perfect. Any other questions, Council? No, Mayor, I'll just uh, back you up on that. I think this is a conversation we need to have and have real soon uh, because uh, fortunately, when I was having, I wasn't having kids, my wife was having kids. But uh, fortunately, when we were having kids and I worked for the county, I had the ability to be off. And I think it's very important that you have not only be the support for the spouse and have that time with the child. Uh, and so we want to uh, get direct um, support from the council. And so I look forward to hoping we can push that to 12 weeks. I believe other cities does it, county does it. And so... Uh, I support you on that effort, and I really hope we can get something moving really quick on that, David. I think it's really important uh, for our uh, em employees. Thank you. Sir. No, I'm not having any more kids. <laughs> Four and no more. <laughs> Jerry. Mayor, I'd also you know, like to agree with that and just say thank you for um, your leadership on this. It's so important. As someone who's having a baby girl on January 11th um, <laughs> and starting a new job, I understand you know, the importance of leave, and especially when you're making decisions about starting a new job, that leave benefit is really important. So um, that's uh, thank you for that. That's really important, of course. Thank you. OK. Thank you, Deanna. Thank you, Appreciate you very much. Next informal report is an update on east side transportation planning projects and sub-regional studies, and Kelly Porter is available if there are any questions. All right. Next informal report is an update on the non-FEMA flood risk area initiative, and Jennifer Dyke is available if there are any questions. We're rolling now. Next informal report is an update on proposed changes to the PID Advisory Board Operating Requirements. And Robert Stearns is available if there are any questions. I don't have any questions. I really just want to thank Robert <clears throat> for all of the tremendous amount of work that he has done in, um, in working with our operating PIDs here recently. And I also want to thank the Law Department for helping us come up with a very clear policy on how those meetings um, should be operated. There was uh, some confusion a couple of weeks ago and in less than two weeks, you've come to us with some sort of game plan. So I know I personally appreciate it because I was fielding those phone calls. All right. Next informal report is uh, Will Rogers Memorial Capital Projects update. Michael Crum is available if there are any questions. Yes, David. Okay. Michael.
Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. Uh, thank, thank you. Um, would you just take us through a couple of the, you know, the, the projects and the rationale behind what we're doing? Sure. So, um, <clears throat> first of all, I'm Mike Crum. I'm the director of the Public Events Department. Um, Will Rogers Memorial Center, a fixture in the event landscape for the city of Fort Worth since 1936. Uh, hosts over 111 events annually, generating 800,000 visitor days. Uh, and in a recent economic impact study that public events did to follow up on the economic impact study that was done by the Fort Worth Stock Show and Rodeo, uh, the facility generates an estimated $331 million a year in direct economic impact for our hospitality community. Um, Anything that is 86 years old requires a lot of work, and the Will Rogers complex is no exception to that. In the uh, informal report in front of you, you can see that we have, uh, through the Public Events Department, approximately $8.3 million scheduled in capital improvement projects for the facility. Uh, based on a decision that this council made uh, last fall uh, concerning restoring some of the capital projects uh, that we had to pull off the docket because of stress on the culture and tourism funds due to the pandemic. Uh, we have another $5.5 million in the queue. And then for your consideration uh, in the coming weeks, we have uh, two projects focused on work to be done in the Will Rogers Coliseum, totaling $7.85 million. Um, you can also see in the IR that we have a fairly aggressive uh, schedule of capital projects in our future capital improvement plans. Uh, and of course, all of that is to be funded out of culture and tourism in balance with other projects that we're going to be talking about later today. Any other questions on that? Okay. Thank okay. you, Okay, thank you very much. Thanks, Mike. And then the final informal report is about Camp Heat, or women in firefighting, and Chief Davis is available if there are any questions. I have one question, and the IR states that there's currently no dollars in the budget for the program, and so I'd like to know how we expand the program with no dollars in the budget and how we rectify that budget. That might be a Chief Davis. Yeah. Is he here? Uh, no. He's not here. Oh. Yep. Mayor Council, my name is Craig Trojic. I'm the public information officer for the Fort Worth Fire Department. Um, Chief Davis is out of town right now uh, at, a, at a training. Um, when it comes to the budget uh, part of this, I'm not sure if I'm the guy to answer any of those questions uh, at this point in time, to be honest with you if that's the only question that we have today. Okay. <laughs> we'll get an answer on that. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Mayor, that concludes my report. Excellent. Councils, the next is uh, questions on action items that are coming for next city council meeting. Any anticipated issues? Go ahead, Elizabeth. Okay. So I noticed on here that there is a vote. Uh, it's MNC. It doesn't say. I'm so used to that. The, um, the extension of the TIF 9 is on there. And yes. I would like, there's been a lot of discussions about when TIFs are sunsetting and when they're not. And I know there's two sunsetting in my particular district that some would not like to sunset, sunset and some would. And so I would appreciate if we could get um, some sort of just explanation as to why we're extending this one as opposed to the others, how long we're extending it for, and what is the total length of that TIF time now? Got it. Okay. No one else? Then our first presentation is an update on future City Hall with Tanyan Farley, Athenian Group. Is Tanyan here? He's coming. All right, thank y'all for having me. Seems like we're moving along a good pace today, so I will try and echo that in our presentation here. Um, 
first off, I just wanted to, uh, before I jump in too far, I want to thank, you know, most of the members of, of council, supporting staff, and otherwise for your time over the last couple weeks to discuss a number of the topics we'll cover today and then a number of other items. As, you know, we continue to repeat, there's so many elements included in a project like this and the programs associated, and so there's been a lot of great support from staff, a lot of great support from council and from our community, and we'll talk a lot about that as we move through. A couple key things I want to hit first. Always want to reiterate the goals of the program, you know, focusing first and foremost on inclusive and engaging public space, and then really driving to make sure that, you know, we carry a number of these elements over the next 50 years. You know, one of the things that's been critical to this program since the outreach, and, you know, one of the things when I sat down with, at the time, Mayor Price and City Manager Cook, and then, you know, my first meeting with Mayor Parker was ensuring that, you know, the people that are working on this program, the teams that are supporting this program, you know, reflect uh, the makeup of the city of Fort Worth, making sure that we have a very diverse team, uh, both on you know the program management and supports teams, but also on a number of the you know components associated to the actual build of the site itself. And so I'm happy to report that you know since our CMAR partner Lindbeck came on board um, in the February March timeframe, we've held uh, five, actually six as of today. There was one at noon today. Uh, business outreach events with a number of the local chambers of commerce, uh, advocacy organizations, and a number of other groups. We've had more than uh, 100 attendees total representing a number of groups in the community. Um, it's also been great to see you know, our partners at Lindbeck and our team combined lay out the package plan uh, for bid so that folks have enough time to prepare for. We've also worked to try to break some of these packages up into smaller and more specified packages so that some of these smaller groups in the community can be involved. We think it's really important that, you know, being the future city hall, being the core uh, for business in this city of Fort Worth, that, you know, everyone that wants to be a part of this program has a shot at being a part of this program. So uh, I continue to ask, you know, mayor, council, and staff, if there are groups that haven't been involved yet that you think should be involved, please continue to reach out to me, and we'll make sure we get them in the loop. But we've been really, really pleased with the participation so far, and we'll continue to do that in partnership with um, Christina Brooks and Gwen Wilson with the city's diversity and inclusion department. Um, Y'all have all received, uh, and I've followed up on our save the date for the city council chamber groundbreaking September 15th. Obviously there are a number of site improvements and otherwise that are gonna take place as we move through uh, some of the final design elements. Uh, you know, this has been, this invite has been sent to the public as well. We'd love to have folks out to the site. This is a groundbreaking, so there will be you know, some areas that are fenced off for active construction, but we are looking to have uh, some virtual reality of the internal of the building. Uh, design boards, a scale model, and we're looking to have uh, some commemorative pins handed out at the event that kind of represent the site itself. I know that City of Fort Worth seems to love lapel pins. We want to lean into that and do something commemorative uh, for the event. I also have a couple surprises that we're going to have for council members and for folks that have been really, you know, strong supporters of this program to date. So I do want to thank uh, Manya Shore and the library group, uh, Michelle and the communications group for all of their work the last couple weeks, as well as you know, obviously Whitney, Carlo, uh, Bethany, and the team from the mayor's staff have been incredible in planning all of this. So I really want to thank all of y'all. Kudos to doing this outside of your normal day job. So I really, really appreciate it. But we're excited for it. I'll keep it short and brief because I know it's going to be hot and we want to make sure we get folks in and out. Um, but if you have any questions on that, please follow up. We look forward to showing you know, everyone kind of what's moving along when we get to that point. Um, in May, uh, so on the council chamber topic, in May we presented really three options that the team had brought forth to the steering committee and city leadership uh, for kind of guidance on where to go next. That was then narrowed to two options. Uh, and in my May presentation to y'all, I noted that we would explore kind of further design on both the porch and flight uh, over the summer. And so I wanted to come back to you with kind of our recommendations. So we completed a number of studies over the summer on both flight and porch. Um, a couple things I wanted to point out on the flight design. Uh, one of the things that we've talked about since the beginning of the program is being welcoming, inviting, and transparent in our program. And that includes bringing in natural light into a council chamber facility. Now I can tell you that isn't done everywhere in the country. It is not an easy task. And you know, with that being said, there's a lot that needs to be done design-wise. We ran a number of, of models uh, simulating shade study and light study kind of all hours, all times of the year. Because as we know, we now have council meetings you know, during the day and at night kind of year round. So we had to look at a number of different models. The flight model we found uh, created light pollution for broadcasts and some problems for uh, folks on the dais and in the crowd. We also have done some preliminary wind studies on the site, uh, being located kind of where it is 
uh, on the corner of downtown right now. There are some components that we have to mitigate when it comes to wind. Uh, the flight study was found in preliminary wind studies to create some additional wind tunnel issues uh, for some of this public area that you're seeing down in the bottom right of the image there. We also looked at, you know, most importantly, being inside the chamber. What does it feel like? What is the experience? We talk about wanting to make that inviting and welcoming. Uh, this model did feel like uh, the ceiling was a little bit lower than it really planned to be. We're looking to have 18-foot ceilings in the chamber uh, to make it inviting, but also be great from an acoustic perspective. Uh, this design kind of struggled with that. And then finally, uh, you know, security is something I have to look at in everything we do. And with the way the roof is uh, sloped in this area, it did provide for a longer line of sight for potential uh, rifle issues. And so with that, um, the team looked at, well, how do we mitigate off these two options? And essentially, through that process, uh, we have made updates to the porch design. And uh, between our steering committee, our project team, and the city leadership group, we are recommending porch for final selection. Um, in this updated rendering here, you can see a couple major changes uh, since our meeting in the spring. Uh, really focused on some of the cutouts you're seeing in the mass timber roof, focused to mitigate some of the wind components. You're also seeing an elongated roof here, which creates not only shade and kind of a nice public space here, but also helped eliminate some of the security issues we were looking at. And then ultimately, overall, uh, this allows us to bring a lot of really great natural light into the space without it being direct into our broadcast or overall meeting operations. So I'm going to show you some updated renderings on these components as we kind of roll through here. Obviously, you know, we talk about this is so much more than just a place for meeting. This is going to be a civic gathering place for the city. So we want to make sure that you know, we created some nice spaces here. Uh, the bollards here will be removable. This can be a nice place for events, um, you know, pre and post council meetings, as well as I think there's, you know, some really cool um, fairs and, and farmers markets that happen in Fort Worth that this could play home to in the future. Uh, looking at it from the river, you know, we wanted to make sure that overall it ties into the building design but stands alone as kind of its own imagery. Um, you know, obviously the Fort Worth flags, we know that's an important piece. Uh, showing kind of from the site here, looking down, so this is a white mass modeling. This is obviously not the color of what the building will be, but to show you uh, conceptually what we're looking at here is to have you know, something off this ground terrace level where the you know, kind of cafeteria food hall concept will be uh, for some alternative meeting spaces, gathering spaces, uh, relaxation spaces. We are working through a lot of the updates to the site. Uh, we've spent a lot of time with downtown Fort Worth Inc., which with members of city staff and otherwise to update that to really give some multi-park type concepts. So it can be meeting, it can be green space and otherwise. I look forward to showing you some of those concepts in my update later this year. Uh, I'm sure with some of you, I'll probably meet with you before then, but we have some exciting things coming there. You're also seeing an update on this side that I don't think we had in the spring, which is uh, in addition of a staircase coming down from the front of the building that does not exist today. So across the site, looking everywhere we can to make it you know, accessible uh, from an ADA perspective, make it walkable uh, from overall mobility perspective, and then ultimately we want to create some really interesting spaces on the site that can be used uh, for meetings and civic events in the future. Uh, we know that nighttime is important, so we're working through uplighting here. I've gotten some great requests from both the public, uh, members of this council and staff, to look at if we could match the color capabilities of the top of the building uh, to the lights here so that we can have you know, colored segments for different holidays and otherwise. That's something we can definitely accommodate. And so we'll work through the final lighting features here. But ultimately, we want this to stand out as folks drive by. We want it to be safe, and we want it to be welcoming kind of all hours of the day. So. That's a bit of where we're at on the outside of the council chambers at this point in time. Um, and you'll see that kind of in a recommendation coming through for uh, resolution next week. Um, we have not shown you yet the interior concepts for the chambers. So I want to run through some of these and get some feedback as we go along. A lot of what I'm showing you today is still in the conceptual stage as we move through uh, some of the components. So coming in off of the ground level, right? So this is the terrace level or the cafeteria level. Um, you are seeing the council workroom, so this room 2020 in the future building. Um, you're seeing one of the possible layouts here. We've worked really closely with city secretary and a number of our steering committee members, as well as yourselves, to identify a couple layouts. Our goal here is to make this room as modular as possible, so it can be home to not only these sessions, but uh, boards and commission, large city meetings, other uh, you know, public gatherings. Uh, that can make this room easily reconfigurable while ultimately having a few core layouts that support broadcast, right? Because ultimately we know that is important. So one of the layouts we're showing here is kind of a, a, 
a more workstation type setup. We also have something similar to what you have today, right, that has kind of the table set up, uh, some presentation components here and here, and then we're showing an executive session room here on the side, right, to give a little bit of flexibility in these rooms. Um, some additional layouts here, uh, you know, kind of viewing what we just saw over the top. Some things I want to point out, you know, as if we were in executive session today, uh, the public monitors that you're seeing out in the crowd today would actually be these kind of large media walls here, uh, which allow the public to see kind of what's going on with having to pan between the multi-TVs. Um, this is kind of more of a, uh, I would say, a public forum type component. This would be used for some of the boards and commissions as well as you know, this would be great for city retirement events and otherwise. And then ultimately for our elected officials and folks sitting at the main uh, work session component, we're looking to put in these confidence monitors above, which would be similar to what you're seeing here today. Uh, they make it easy for you to have these work sessions, uh, pay attention to those components, and you know, ultimately have it hidden without you know, so many uh, hanging monitors in the space. We're still working on finishes, acoustics, and otherwise. Um, you know, one of the things is a challenge as well with making uh, a lot of the components windows is you do have acoustic challenges. We have a really great team on board that's working through some of those components. A couple of things I want to point out uh, as we go through this, you can see uh, we're looking to make these uh, as flexible and modular as possible so that you can have speakers, your laptops, charging stations, waters, et cetera, easily accessible here. We're even looking you know, how we can conceal some of those components as we go along. So more to come here, but I wanted you all to kind of see where we're at here. And I appreciate a lot of the feedback I've gotten from the group so far, which allows us to provide some of these updated uh, configurations for this room at this point. So I want to move upstairs uh, to the main public session uh, council chambers. One of the things that uh, I want to show here that I talked about last time is um, the uh, addition of these Patriot One type components here. This is a alternative security metal detector component that focuses on AI and machine learning to understand you know, what weapons are being brought in and out of facility. Um, it also pairs with a potential VRS system, which uh, can detect weapons up to 300 yards away on external cameras. So we're still very much working through these components. We want to be safe, but we also want to be welcoming and inviting. So I really appreciate Valerie, uh, Marshall Swift, and Sergeant Hobbs for helping us through this process and kind of helping us weigh the pros and cons of all these. Still a lot to be decided there, but ultimately, you know, want to continue to improve that, uh, you know, constituent experience. Going forward, a couple things I want to point out. Um, and this is for the public session chamber. Um, showing a acoustic vestibule here going in. We know that one of the things that happens today in long council meetings, those doors open and close all day, and we know that can be number one annoying, but can lead to safety issues as well when folks can't see in and out of the chamber. Uh, it, it also makes this a much more welcoming component. So we're looking at you know, where we put ballistic, where we put blast resistant glass in this component. So we're still working through some of these, but showing an overall view into what the chambers could potentially look like. So. You'll see a carryover of the mass timber component into the chamber itself. Uh, we're also showing a couple things that you might notice that are different than the chamber today. Number one is three podiums is one of the things we're looking at here in the front. Uh, we'll show a, a look down in just a second, but we've worked with our city secretary team, uh, some of the folks that help run and monitor the meeting from an AV and IT perspective, and ultimately these will all be modular podiums, uh, meaning they can be either used during or not used during meetings. They'll have data connections in the floor and we'll have monitors on them to present. The middle will be an ADA sit-stand podium that can also be used for larger staff presentations, and then we'll have uh, you know, the single podiums on the side at this point in time. You also have a great view out onto the green space here. Once we finalize what that green space looks like, I'll have a number of those views looking out of here. Ultimately, we want to have daylight coming in. We want to be able to showcase some of that really beautiful greenery, and then ultimately, uh, with the reroute of the bypass channel, um, you know, we'll have some great views here as well. I'm going to show you more of a model concept because I want to talk a little about what we just mentioned, right, which is these three podiums. So having these be modular, having monitors on these components, we're still going to work through the operations of all that because I know that's a bit of a change from what we're doing today, but this will also greatly help with when you do, uh, you know, awards, presentations, recognitions. It'll make it easy to kind of give those components down here. We're also showcasing a couple things here. Uh, we're looking at LED nameplates on the dais. Number one, to make it easy for our staff that runs and operates the meeting to uh, swap names in and out, both for council sessions, but maybe for larger boards and commissions or other groups. I know that zoning commission, some other folks tend to use this room from time to time. We're also showing uh, two large media walls here. Uh, we're hoping to replace the uh, two 
monitor and side projector set up this in the chamber today to allow the public to focus on two areas. These are rated as uh, either 0.9 or 1.2 monitors, meaning uh, they're visible at an extremely clear level up to 100 feet away. So the back seat of the chamber is about 75 feet away on a slight grade. Uh, so this should provide a great viewing experience for all the folks in the crowd as well. Um, just another view here, kind of looking up. I, you know, we always joke that Jeanette is our standard for you know height coming off the dais and looking out. So if it works for her, it should work for the group. So something we're kind of constantly working through. But you can see kind of what that sit stand component could look like here. So I want to look at one thing real quick with y'all. Um, we know today, right, your monitors are sitting on top of uh, the dais. We also know you have a lot of your own laptops, papers, charging, etc. One of the things we're looking to do is number one, conceal these monitors a little bit uh, to make it easy for uh, y'all to have them look at what you need to during meetings, vote, et cetera, but also have room for your laptops, places to charge, et cetera. And then ultimately, you know, we want to try and make it as easy as possible for our IT and AV staff from the city to uh, perform maintenance, swap these items out. There is always a trade-off when you go highly custom versus highly flexible, and so I think we found a nice way to do that. As these move along, we'll have mock-ups that will show you and kind of some of those components. This will also help for some of our council members uh, you know, that currently may have to have their seats really high or really low on the dais based on height. Uh, this will have some adjustability, which will, I think, uh, provide a consistent line of sight throughout. Uh, and I think Jane has a question really quickly. Yes, fire away. I had the pleasure of filling in for the mayor at the airport board meeting recently, and I like the way their technology was set up at each, at each individual station. Sure. Have you seen that? Uh, so I have not been to the Fort Worth, uh, the DFW, DFW board meetings, no ma'am, but uh, I can tell you we definitely would love to, to see what they're running today. Okay. We also have been working with uh, the city secretary group and some of the folks that represent mayor and council on a really easy software control system to make your life a lot easier. But yeah, happy to go check it out. I'm always trying to learn new things. We talked about you know uh, DJ Harrell and myself, some of the things that are happening in development at City of Dallas as well. We're trying to learn from that. You're as we pretty go excited about this, I can tell. I you. I love it. I <laughs> really do. I really do. Well, thank you for talking about height. You know that is something that I'm concerned about. But Maddie, you, you might want to, before he goes there, give him some insight into it. It may yeah. not work, but it was very, I thought it was very accessible. Mm -hmm. The screens are built in, yeah. and I thought that was pretty cool. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Yeah, and Go one of the... the next slide. Yeah, yeah built in. that's similar, Gina, I think. Yeah, yeah agreed. Mm -hmm. Great. And I think, too, uh, I'm excited to hear that you like that, because that's the direction we want to go. It's best from an overall best practice perspective. We're also going to show you some mock-ups that we've shown, uh, you know, the city secretary team and some of the other folks that will have kind of a multi-view on your monitor that allow you to kind of select and bring full screen, whether it's the live view, whether okay. it's voting, all those kind of components. I really want to try and minimize your need to have to look up and at screens in the audience throughout so you can kind of focus on what you need to and also ultimately on the public speaker. And David, did you tell them about UNT, their magnificent wiring? UNT, the, and with their remodeling off of Camp Bowie and Montgomery, mm -hmm. you can stand anywhere in this room, and the, it's mic'd. The whole room is mic'd. Oh, wow, that's fantastic. And so that would be pretty cool for you to yeah. visit. I actually thought someone remote was with us in the room, but it's, I, I can tell you exactly, the whole campus, the, the new sure. part is wired that way. I think you need to look at it. Fantastic. Yeah, we'd love to. Okay. We'd love to. Uh, quick com comment, if I could, if you go back two slides. Um, on the floor, the, the different podiums there will, I don't know about you guys, but one thing I feel is awkward is if we come down onto the floor to give an award or recognize somebody, our back is turned to the group. I, I think it'd be so much better if we were facing them, of, of course. Would sure. that be possible? Yeah, definitely. Uh, because this is, you know, early conceptually, there's a lot we can do as far as making the middle podium rotating and yeah, other components, exactly. so definitely doable, yep. Great. Okay, any other thoughts on the council chamber? All right, I'm gonna move forward a couple components here, obviously a lot more to do here. We'll come back to y'all with some of the finishes and other components. We've also spent some really good time with, um, with Marshall Swift and Sergeant Hobbs and, and the crew talking about you know where we place 
uh, you know, members of our security detail and otherwise in the chambers as well as support staff. So a lot more to come there uh, as we kind of move forward. Uh, I want to start to show you all some concepts that we've been looking at for the lobby and terrace and the existing tower. So we've talked about some of the refresh that we're going to do to the building, not only to A, accommodate more members of the city of Fort Worth, uh, but B, also to update the building to kind of continue to make it a municipal space. So uh, today in the lobby, if you've been in there, is a you know a beautiful lobby. It looks like it was built in 2004. There are also a number of components here that are not uh, you know, in, in the building today. So I want to show you kind of what we're looking at potentially concept wise. So a couple things, I'll go around the horn here. Um, this is coming in from um, the kind of tiered entrance right here off of Weatherford uh, and Belknap. Um, coming off the entrance, so we're looking at kind of two areas here. We've been working with Carlo and members of mayor staff to look at some of the really cool gifts from sister cities, uh, and other components that have come that are kind of scattered throughout the third floor today. Uh, some of them aren't displayed today. We want to look at maybe how it can bring some of those really cool pieces into the lobby so the public can enjoy them. We also want to create some you know, informal meeting spaces for pre and post council as well as you know, potential queuing for our customer service one-stop shop experience. You're also seeing over on this side as we head towards the new council facility, right? That's what you're seeing down here. Um, a pre-council lobby area, so the lobby, the area that's sitting out there today, rethinking that to have not only monitors to broadcast the meeting, but also places for some of the informal meetings that happen throughout the day on council meetings. We also want to bring and make our purchasing components and some of the bid drops, as well as some of the kiosks uh, for customer service that are spread throughout the, the city. We want to bring those together into this kind of easy to access facility off of the main lobby. And then ultimately we want to create some you know, really interesting meeting and, and sitting spaces throughout the lobby for folks to kind of queue and then provide a few ways to get information and wayfinding. We know that you know, folks that maybe in my generation are much more apt to uh, you know, use an application or look up online where they're going. We know that there's really five generations in a city hall process, right? And so you have to think about how you program for each of those. So we're looking to have you know, in-person information desk, possibly some greeters, and then you know, what we can do technologically to move people through. A couple of things I want to point out, we're looking at having a media briefing room right here off the council chamber facility, as well as some additional space for uh, our marshals and other components as we go through. So I wanted to show you the big picture. So as we go through some of the renderings, you can see some of those. So what you're seeing on the left in all of these will be the existing today. And what you're seeing on the right is kind of what's proposed going forward. So where possible, right, we want to be uh, the best stewards of public funds that we can. And so we want to reuse some of the beautiful pieces that are in there. Some of this beautiful uh, red stone that's in the lobby, we want to repurpose. But we want to make some of this uh, existing wood component that's sitting here a little bit more durable for the long term. Uh, this was in a Class A facility, um, and that's great. But from a maintenance perspective, when these get dinged, which they will in a municipal space, uh, it's much easier if they're you know covered in something like a scuff master, which is a high uh, resilient coating that kind of uh, protects the overall element itself and also looks good over a longer period of time, easier from a maintenance perspective. So something we're looking at here, these are existing finishes on the floor and existing finishes on the wall that we're tying into. In the elevator lobby, if you've been in the space today, uh, really interesting elevator lobby, some kind of old New York looking uh, elevator lanterns here, really high gloss floor and then kind of a darker red area. Um, there's a number of components we're looking at here. You know, we want to lower the gloss uh, from just an overall feel. We want to try and brighten the space. You're seeing some LED panels in the ceiling. You're seeing a change in the kind of elevator bays themselves to tie more in with design. And then ultimately on the back wall here, we're looking at actually adding um, an LED panel. I don't know if you've been in the uh, Worthington Renaissance downtown, but they have an LED panel at the end of the elevator that really helps with wayfinding. And otherwise, we want to find everywhere we can to have rotational signage and to draw people into places and make it welcoming and inviting. Um, in the lobby itself, uh, so this would be into your right off of the main entrance. We're looking at adding a coffee cafe concept here uh, for staff, council meetings, visitors that are coming to the building. You also see some shots here of where we're looking at having monitors for forward TV, council meeting, rotational signage. Really everywhere we can, we want to maximize that space. Uh, look at digital, look at rotational. This is also a great place that we can rotate some of the really cool pieces from Fort Worth Public Art that they keep in a digital archive. So some of those components you're seeing here. 
looking down on that space, uh, you can see that you know something like this will be brought in and run by an external vendor. Uh, we'll look to have you know a, the barista type concept here, some food grab and go, and then ultimately a nice kind of flow space for pre and post council meetings, as well as for folks that are coming to work with our development services or customer service functions that provides them kind of a nice break space during that time period. Um, in the more pre-council lobby area, so different types of seating for different types of meetings. I think I want to give Selena, I don't know if she's here today, but kudos for the work she's done with the pre-council space today, uh, kind of revamping that to, I think, help draw people to some of the concepts we're looking for, providing some alternative spaces here, having charging and power in a number of these places. If you're like me, you're constantly finding places to charge, and so it's something we're thinking about kind of everywhere in the space. Um, just another view, kind of looking down at the coffee in the pre-council area. Um, looking out of the council chamber's uh, wing, right, on the lobby level, a couple things we want to point out here. So number one, uh, the escalator coming off of the terrace level directly to that council area. And then we're looking at having a really cool media wall concept here that can serve as wayfinding, agenda listing, some of the components we have sprinkled throughout current city hall we want to centralize here and digitize. We've also been working with DJ Harrell and a number of the functions that are going to be on our one-stop shop experience to see if we can maybe make some of this a touchscreen queuing experience, right, to really make it as easy for our development services functions as possible. And then ultimately here, from a finished perspective, trying to carry on some of the concept you saw on the lobby side. This is coming off of our terrace level, our cafeteria, our ground level out of the parking garage, uh, looking to have some additional video wall slash video wayfinding here, media wayfinding, potentially agenda components here that will help direct people either up the elevator um, or into the cafeteria slash uh, council chamber area to the left. You can see what that space is today. It's not really welcoming or inviting. It's kind of a back of house function. So it's something that you know, we think we have an a, a really opportunity to make it a cool space in a municipal facility. Uh, I think finally here, I just have a couple more shots on the lobby I want to show you. Uh, this is what I was talking about potentially for the purchasing area as well as some of these kiosks that we talked about that could be uh, some of the kiosks that sit at municipal courts uh, today, some of the functions that we do uh, for water bill pay and otherwise, uh, some of those other kind of components, we're looking at how we can consolidate some of those functions here and then make the purchasing experience as seamless as possible, not only for our employees, but for contractors and others that may be coming to bid in this area. Um, any questions on the lobby and terrace concepts at this point in time? All right. Great. Thank you. I appreciate it. All right. So, mayor and council floor. Go so, I'm going to show y'all. I, I do. Oops, I'm sorry. sorry. I'm just a little oh. slow today. Uh, no worries. No uh, worries. <laughs> okay. I'm okay with the uh, selecting the porch versus the uh, flight roof concept and all that. I'm just curious. I mean, y'all go through a CFD analysis, right, to determine the wind tunnel effects. Yes, correct. Yep. So we have gone through a number of different studies. We also have some additional studies as well uh, that are coming forth. A lot of this was done on the decision side in our 3D models, obviously, without the building being completed. But yeah. uh, we've had some really great folks on board to help right. us with that process. You know, one thing that I noticed, I think if I'm remembering the slides correctly, you had openings in the roof around the perimeter for the porch concept, but you didn't have that for the flight. Correct. Um, Part of what we struggled with in modeling of the flight concept is with the angle of that facility. Um, we were trying to minimize uh, the use of steel in that component due to extremely long lead times. And so we were looking at using the heavy timber, which is kind of we lean towards the porch. With the way structurally flight was designed, that became very problematic even with cutouts uh, on the flight concept. Got it. And then um, I don't. Unless I missed it, I don't know if you covered this in your slide. I was looking at slide 20. Where is the visitor overflow area in relation to the council chambers? Yep. So visitor overflow area. So we really are providing three visitor overflow areas. Okay. So concept one, let me go back here. So concept one is going to be this pre-council lobby area, which will have... Let me skip to it. So this area right here, kind of all throughout this space, as well as the next two slides, will all have council meetings and council audio in this area that can flow. And this is directly off of the council, the main council area, right? So it's off the lobby level. We will also have the, the council work session room, like this one that's just downstairs, which will carry that component. And then we're looking to actually having 
uh, the council broadcasts an audio on the terrace, so the outside covered area as well. So to give kind of three different unique spaces. And to give you a general idea, combined, those three visitor areas can accommodate how many people? So the, Standing and seated? Yeah, so the uh, main council chamber for public session is 250 public seats. Uh, the council work session room is approximately 100 uh, seats. And then the uh, pre-council areas in the lobby is an additional 50 to 60 seats. And then the outside area can accommodate roughly 100 at this point in time. We're also providing Wi-Fi on the outs outdoor terrace area as well uh, for connectivity, not only for staff, but for guests as well uh, during that time period. Great. Thank you. Any other questions on? Okay. Great. I just got two more things real quick I'm going to run through here. Mayor and, Mayor and council floor. Uh, so I'm going to show a couple of shots here uh, coming off of the elevator to the mayor and council floor in the new building. Something we want to do is create you know, a welcoming and inviting space for uh, our sister cities components, for our economic development components that may be coming to meet with council members and also for you know, staff and public that are coming up there. Uh, one of the things we're looking at here is a media wall type concept. Think about this like a Samsung frame TV where you can display art throughout the day, but it's also perfect for welcoming visitors, guests, et cetera. Um, we're also looking at you know, having a uh, augmented mayor's conference room. So uh, what this is a acoustic panel. So this can be whatever imagery we'd like. So part of what we'll be working with y'all on in the coming months is what Fort Worth means to you that we want to showcase in this area. And so we're working with a number of groups to talk about what that might be, but this will provide acoustical support in the room. We're also looking at, you know, um, you know kind of an inlet there that you can sit on during the meeting to pop in and out. And then ultimately, and we have video broadcasting and those presentations are important. We want to make the mayor's conference room not only great for, for the folks that are using it within the city, but then, you know, any components for when we bring folks in from the public. Where are all the shovels going to go, Tanyan? <laughs> That is a great point, and that <laughs> shovels, airplane models. We have like a collection of multiple. No, but really, that's that's why we're looking at in the lobby having some of those gallery areas because there are some really cool pieces on the third I'm floor. I'm just that I joking. Think, I know. No, but it's true. It's true. It's true. <laughs> so. Not at this point in time. Right. Yeah, not at this point in time. Yeah. Okay. All right, uh, we will have a work cafe on this floor, so something that you can have informal meetings, staff can have breaks, and otherwise, uh, you know, this is in the kind of elevated break room experience, Wi-Fi, charging, et cetera, that will kind of support overall work in this area, but also when you want to bring guests and other staff into the space, an informal meeting area. And then finally, I want to just run through the one-stop shop experience. So one of the things that we've talked about since the beginning, and I appreciate uh, the support from all the council members on this, but especially you know, council members Crane and Firestone for your support of our public sessions that we had on this. I want to show you a bit of an update of kind of where we're at here. Some of you may have saw the announcement this morning from City of Dallas that they have purchased a facility in which they're looking to bring a number of their customer facing services to create a one stop shop experience. We have the luxury of being many months ahead of them. So I anticipate that, you know, we'll probably work together and, and help them along the way. But some things we want to show here. Uh, we spent a lot of time with DJ Harrell, uh, with a lot of the other departments, uh, fire prevention, PAR, TPW, HR, uh, and water uh, specifically to really bring together you know, a number of functions here. What you're seeing is a neighborhood type concept, which brings public services out to the components coming up, right? So uh, all these desks you're seeing here are being worked through as fine as what those are going to be. Are they going to be rotational? Are they going to be fixed? How much of this can we do digitally versus how much should we do in-house? So a lot of cool things that are developing here. As these move along, we'll show you a lot of those pieces that have come forth. I want to show you some of the imagery here, right? So we want to show you, you know, some of the information desk. We're looking at some huddle rooms here that can be used by staff uh, to bring the public into these spaces instead of bringing the public back into staff areas. This creates some really cool working spaces as well as gives some of the public some views from the tower. And then ultimately here you see kiosks, digital components as we kind of move through. So, you know, early on in this concept, but excited about what this means for our development services function. We heard, you know, uh, Councilmember Flores, you brought up, you know, some of the feedback there. I know that in addition to the functional components we're working on for this, I, you know, we are a part of a lot of the operational components as well. And I know there's a lot of hard work going in there that we're trying to layer into the tower. So. Okay, a couple upcoming things I want to hit. Um, first thing, obviously, next week, uh, the council chamber design resolution vote, as I kind of ran through what the, the staff uh, and project team's recommendation is. 
We then have our DDRB review September 1st. Um, uh, we've had some great initial conversations with uh, Andy Taft and Melissa and the group over at Downtown Fort Worth Inc. And I've got some great feedback to help shape the design. Our groundbreaking ceremony is September 15th. And then ultimately, uh, in addition to our site work starting in September, uh, we will also be starting our demolition of many of the floors in the tower to start our renovations there in late September. So exciting things, a lot of things going, um, a lot I covered today. Any kind of questions or thoughts for me at this point in time? Any other questions for Tanyan? Great job. Thank you, Tanyan. I don't have a question. I'll make a comment. David, how many departments, how many buildings are we moving into this when we do it? We are moving. We are moving people out of 14 city facilities. Mm -hmm. We are moving 20, we are moving parts of 23 departments. And at initial move, we'll be right around 1,500 city employees that are coming in here. So quite a few moving parts. Yeah, I appreciate the pres presentation. I, what I want people to understand is we're trying to make the city government more accessible for them in a lot of different ways. And right now, when you don't even know where to start, I don't right. even know sometimes where places are, sure. that if the more the, the more departments and things we have here, if they show up and go, I'm just trying to get this question answered, they're not coming to our office, they're trying to whatever, find another office, that that's what we're trying ultimately to do, at least is, is I think this council's goal. So people can look at their city government, say it's working for you, and this is what we're doing to help. And so exactly. while we've gotten maybe some flack of this building, et cetera, and what we're doing, sure. I don't think people understand how vast and wide and what all we're bringing together. So I thank you for the presentation. I guess, David, to follow up on that, I, I'm envisioning the teams that you and I talked about when it comes to development services, and I'm hoping that we'll see teams there, meaning people from different departments who may not be answering directly to DJ, but so that the development process can be flowing more smooth. Yes. The answer is yes. I'll take yes. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Tanya. Appreciate it. Thank you. Now you got to maintain his excitement when he finishes this. I don't think I don't know if he's going to be excited again. But this, yeah. Well, it's Council, our next presentation is Culture and Tourism Capital Project Update with Michael Crum. Public events. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I brought a friend with me. Hi, Bob. Yeah. Bob Jamison, visit Fort Worth. Good, morning. Good afternoon, everybody. Okay, so the reason that we are here today is that because in uh, November of last year, uh, City Council approved $52 million in ARPA money to jumpstart uh, the, the tabled convention center expansion project. Um, at the same time, about this time last year, our hospitality industry started to recover. If you'll remember, because of the pandemic, tax revenues bottomed out, uh, and it was about a year ago that we saw, saw growth start uh, that today has us, uh, by the end of this fiscal year, exceeding 2019 levels of hospitality tax collections. With an upward growth curve in tax revenues, uh, we have started to think about the future. And so today's presentation is to talk to you about major capital projects that, uh, that we are talking about uh, for the culture and tourism funds with a particular emphasis on the convention center expansion project. And uh, Bob, as the, uh, the one of the people who has been a proponent of convention center expansion for long before I ever got here, uh, is going to help us with the history lesson. And then I'll be talking to you today uh, about what we've been up to uh, since that jump start last November. Um, before we start with the convention center, uh, there are two projects that uh, that uh, we are talking about for culture and tourism that are going to uh, be coming to you over the next several months. Uh, after this presentation, you're going to hear from my teammate Robert Stearns uh, about the opportunity to expand the Omni Hotel to 1,000 rooms and an additional 50,000 square feet of meeting space. Uh, this project was part of the Convention Center District Plan that was part of the Hunden Study in 2019, and we are very excited uh, that Omni uh, is back at the table 
uh, to, uh, to help take this uh, destination to another level from a convention and meeting standpoint. Additionally, uh, we'll be hearing soon from our friends at the Fort Worth Stock Show and Rodeo about the next opportunity to partner with the Stock Show and Rodeo on another facility renovation at the Will Rogers Memorial Center. Uh, for those of you who have been around, you are familiar uh, with the partnership that the city has with the Stock Show where for the rental renovation of cattle barns one and two and the construction of the tower promenade, uh, essentially it was a 50-50 agreement where while the city issued the debt uh, for those projects, the Stock Show covered half the cost. And, uh, you know, I can can tell you that from my experience to have a partner uh, that is willing to put in half the money to develop facilities that they essentially use one month out of the year, that is extraordinary. Uh, so we expect uh, our friends Brad Barnes and Matt Carter to come to us in the next several months with the opportunity to renovate the sheep and swine barns, and we are accounting for that in our projections for culture and tourism capital projects. Let's talk about the convention center. And for this part, I'll turn it over to Bob. Well, thank you very much. And um, thanks for the opportunity to, to bring you up to date on this. Um, you know, you saw a picture uh, just a second ago of, of what it was like when it was originally built, the JFK Theater um, on the south end. Um, and if you look at that, you see that there is uh, water gardens, not in a manner in which we remember them, but uh, perhaps how they were under construction, and you see where we are today. Um, you know, here are a series of dates that are significant in the history of the building. I think what I would share with you about that is the fact that you can see, more than anything else, you can see how the building and its utilization has evolved over time. And when it opened, you know, it was, um, you know, it was a civic center more than it was a convention center. And it was a premier spot for concerts and ticketed items. The county, not a recipient of anything that resembled occupancy tax or sales tax relative to that, was trying to make it work on the revenue uh, stream. And so, you know, there were, um, there, were, there were boat shows and RV shows and the rest of that. And, uh, um, and then the occasional meeting or conference. And, as our hotel inventory came online, and as uh, Fort Worth has grown in a destination, that facility has adapted to the needs and has evolved in the way that our city has evolved relative to, to that kind of um, activity and that kind of opportunity. Um, in 2002 and three, um, you know, Mayor Barr followed by Mayor Moncrief led us through the first real expansion that uh, that started to claim the building for a purpose that uh, it serves today, which is predominantly meetings and conventions. And there you see phase one, again, the adding the ballroom at the top in place of the Kennedy, um, you know, you know, the Kennedy uh, um, theater. And then you also see what was done to uh, add some meeting space in the southern two thirds of the building around the exhibit cell. Um, since then, you know, we've, we've engaged in a conversation. It's time for the next kind of generational consideration of this project in this building and its expansion as a meeting facility and really to recognize how people meet in it today versus how they met in it 20 years ago when it was last significantly addressed. Um, you know, here are some, you know, there, here are some um, statistics that tell us that the time is right or the time has been right for a while for us to take on this project and to spend the time that we have over the last several years to get ready for, you know, for the, you know, the expansion of the facility. Um, the, the city has grown. Um, the hospitality economy has grown. I think more importantly than that, though, is you get down to the second to the last bullet and you see that we've had study after study, update after update, that continues to track the fact that we have demand 
people want to be here, people want to meet in Fort Worth, and, um, and we can't accommodate them at the level that we could. So, you know, so we've got, you know, in some respects, we're burning money because you're not, we're not able to accommodate them. Um, and now's the time to, to move forward on that. Um, and then just as Mike said, you know, we're, we're in a very healthy place. The strength of the market, is, you know, has, has resumed quickly. We're not quite at the hotel occupancy level we were in 2019. But that's because investors believed in the future of this city as a meeting destination, and they added hotel inventory during the pandemic. And so increased demand, more room nights are being sold in the city limits of Fort Worth than ever before. And uh, it's just spread a little more broadly across the community. So, you know, a lot of statistics tell us that uh, that the health of the market that pointed us in this direction is still there. And, uh, and you know, and that this is an important, significant project for the city and uh, the impact it'll have not only in downtown, but will, you know, but will ripple throughout the community. So uh, back in 2019, as Bob referenced, after an extended community conversation about the future of Fort Worth's hospitality industry, uh, we developed recommendations about what the convention center of the future would look like. And not only the convention center, but a convention center district. Uh, essentially, uh, what the studies from 2019 call for is a 50% increase in the meeting space uh, in comparison to the current facility. So uh, as we'll talk about in a minute in a two-phase expansion, ultimately uh, the arena uh, would go away and would be replaced by traditional meeting space, an additional 100,000 square feet of exhibit space, um, a ballroom that would be more than double the size of the current ballroom that we have in the convention center, and then meeting rooms or breakout rooms uh, to uh, support that additional space. In addition, uh, the Hunden study called for uh, the development of two what I would call super tanker hotels immediately adjacent uh, to the convention center. We're about to talk about the creation of one of those super tankers. And then the other one uh, will be created by some things that we're going to do in the first phase of the convention center uh, expansion project, which then creates the opportunity to place another large property on Commerce Street on the east side of the building. Uh, base assumptions about how we're approaching the project. First of all, a decision was made that we're going to continue to operate the facility while we're renovating and expanding. Uh, that'll require two phases of construction. The first phase, which is essentially the creation of back of house facilities uh, that will support the facility during the second phase and afterwards. Um, and then a second phase, which really represents the true expansion of, uh, of meeting space in the building. The other part of this is the assumption that we are going to realign Commerce Street uh, and that Realigning Commerce Street creates property on the east side of Commerce that the city can use to uh, incent, for example, another super tanker hotel. At the same time, uh, we are going to have to wrestle with the operational challenges that street realignment represents for the convention center because when you realign the street, you take away much of the storage space that the, the current building has, and we're going to have to figure out how to work our way through that. Um, so phase one uh, is the back of house renovation we described, building new back of house kitchen facilities, a new loading dock, and the realignment of Commerce Street, along with some work to set the stage for phase two of the expansion. And then phase two is what we've described. The arena comes down and traditional meeting space is built in its place. Uh, this is a representation uh, of that. You can see the blue is what is created in, uh, in phase one. The red is what is created in phase two. Um, 
first phase of expansion currently estimated at $67 million. ARPA gives us a great jump uh, coming out of the gate. Uh, we'll be coming back to you with a recommendation later in this calendar year, I believe, uh, to issue $15 million in debt to, uh, to increase the size of the project budget. Um, as it stands today, uh, we think that construction would start in the second quarter of 2023 and that would end by the conclusion of 2025. Uh, again, a representation of what happens in phase one. The blue is the new back of house uh, food and beverage facilities. The red uh, represents the area that will be the new loading dock. Do not look at this and say this is the design. We're just playing here, right? And then this, this uh, reflects a uh, complete uh, straightening of Commerce Street, which we believe is still a question. Um, phase two, the future of phase two is a little hazier. Ma'am. Why is it a question, the straightening of Commerce? Uh, we're trying to think through how we balance the functional needs of the convention center with what happens when we straighten Commerce Street out. So we're trying, we're, we're wrestling with the question right now. But it's we're not if not it's when it's when it's just how they're going to do okay. it. Okay, it, right. Thank you. That's what I did not hear correctly, and I was like, "Wait, are we not straightening out commerce?" But we're still straightening out commerce. Correct. We're we're trying to figure that out. <laughs> okay, so there's a potential that commerce might not be straightened. It, it it's going to be straighter than it was. We just don't know how straight. <laughs> 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 Here, look, at Elizabeth. Council Member. Look. <laughs> I, we, we might be getting ahead of ourselves here. Okay. I think, you know, I mean, it all comes down to how do you address the need for loading docks? Right. And there will be a variety of choices there that have cost factors and they have implications on what happens to Commerce Street. Okay. And we're going to have to look at all of those and figure out what serves the best purpose overall. Okay. And so, you know, so the intent is still to straighten out Commerce Street. It does have some ramifications for the loading dock mm -hmm. solution. And we have to, you know, and we have to come back with what those choices are. So I would implore you to make sure that we're communicating with our folks across the street at Texas A&M because I think a lot of the assumptions on their campus expansion are based on the fact that we are straightening out Commerce Street. So if that changes, I think we need to know and they need to know probably before and, and as you'll see later in the, in, the, in the presentation, we're bringing them into the conversation. Okay. Good. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. So uh, phase two of the expansion uh, is, from a timing standpoint, is a little hazier. Uh, two reasons. Uh, one is that the cost of the project has gone up significantly. Uh, so whereas three years ago we were looking at something south of $400 million, now we're looking at something north of $500 million. At the same time, while tax revenues, we're optimistic about the recovery of tax revenues, they are not yet back on the pace that was anticipated to fund phase two back in 2019. So a lot of TBD here, a lot of work to do before we make decisions. This just gives you an idea of what phase two looks like. Again, flying saucer uh, will bid at a fond farewell, serve this community well for a very long time. Uh, it will be replaced by uh, the additional me uh, convention space that we discussed earlier. And I would say this is just a concept of how the space fits. This is not designed in any way. Yep. You know, th there's nothing remotely final about what you're looking at. So. This, is, this is from the 2019 conceptual study. So since November, what have we been up to? Um, along with the ARPA money in November of 2021, Mayor and Council approved the retention of Broadus and Associates as the project manager uh, for the uh, expansion project. Uh, this past spring, uh, we engaged JLL Hospitality uh, to go talk to our customers 
about the changes that they've seen in the meetings industry since the pandemic. We talked about the future and how things may have changed. So uh, we charge JLL to go to our customers, past, present, and our aspirational customers, those that we want to bring to Fort Worth in the future as a result of an expanded, improved convention center. Um, they've come back with some, uh, some customer feedback that we'll share with you in a subsequent presentation. Um, at the same time, we have uh, convened a, a group that uh, has a recommendation for you to consider on September 13th uh, for a design team for phase one of the project. Uh, and on the heels of that, we'll be coming back uh, later in the fall with a recommendation on construction manager at risk. Um, we also uh, are going to need your wisdom on uh, a group to assemble uh, of constituents uh, who can offer us feedback on the project. Council Member Beck, to your point, this is where we see uh, folks like Texas A&M entering the conversation. So we anticipate them entering the conversation at which step again? The this, uh, we, we believe that's going to happen this fall. So the project manager? Project, man, project manager is set. That okay, was, I'm sorry, sorry. So the yep. CMR recommendation or the project feedback committee? So we'll have recommendations for you for design team. That's already in the queue. Okay. Uh, we have a recommendation for you for the construction manager at risk uh, that we're going to talk to you about today that we'll ask you to a formally approve probably in September. Uh, and and then... And they're, they're approving... I'm sorry, I just want to make sure we get this sure. right because this is a massive expansion for a very large area of downtown. Um, so the design team recommendation we will have before we engage in the project feedback? Well, no, no. Okay. No, the, the recommendation on the design team is who to hire. Okay. Yes. So, and then we and, move on to engaging stakeholders. That's right. Yes. We have, okay. you know, we bring the design team, we put them to work, and then in the process of getting thoughts from them, we have this, you know, this constituent group, folks that have interest and expertise relative to what the building can do and how it should relate to the area. Okay. And those folks then provide guidance and, and challenge proposals and consider options and, and ultimately, you know, are influencing recommendations that come to this group for final approval. Okay. So I don't know that I'm in, we can have the, a, deeper conversation later. I don't know that I'm hearing in this timeline, in this process, the type of collaboration that I kind of envision, particularly with the major players down there. That's this I, group. That's yeah. this group. Yeah, right. I, I so think that, that's downtown Fort Worth, Inc. Right. That's Texas A&M. That's, you know, other, you know. You know so. Right. I would... I there think it's probably prudent to include them when we start even talking about the design because, sure. you know, they're going to have their own design. And when it comes to things like a and going to build their building, we're going to build ours. Mm -hmm. um, but we have to think of that whole area. Um, we have to think of it holistically and not just as their project, our project. Right. Correct. Um, and when specifically when you're looking at things like traffic management, so what happens if a and having a symposium and the convention center is having, you know, what is that going to look like? Because um, that's a design issue, but also our green space down there and how right. mm -hmm. we're really capitalizing on that and, and potentially shared green space. So some of ours and some of theirs, it makes it bigger. And so I think sooner in that process rather than later right. is is really what what I would like to see. Yeah, we, we were we were hoping you would serve on this group. Oh, see, I opened my mouth, and now I'm on. <laughs> I'll be there. <laughs> okay, so we'll bop back a couple slides. Um, so um, this is your staff team uh, that's been uh, been working on the project. Uh, the The contracts in this case are held by property management. Uh, 
public events because of our role in managing the center as a as a, a large presence in this group. I cannot be more complimentary of the work that Gwen Wilson has done with our team to make sure that we are uh, pushing business equity to the extent that we can under the law. And so we think we have uh, we have uh, good results from that to date and look forward to good results in that regard in the future. And then, of course, the financial management services team uh, led by Reggie. It's, uh, it's one thing to design it and price it, but uh, the finance guys have to tell us if we can afford it. And so, uh, so we're doing a lot of debt modeling uh, these days based on uh, what we see as the trending in not only tax collections, but the pricing, uh, prospective pricing of projects. I have a, a question. David, do we have a, a subject matter expert on ADA? Because you know, just like I mentioned it during the new city hall, I know we do what's right and what's required, and that's probably the minimum. But do we have a, a subject matter expert on ADA? Because we, we got to make sure we go over and beyond. Yeah, I'm sure there is on the design team. Okay. Yes. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Uh, I'd like to see that name on this. It just heightens the, the importance of it. On this sheet, yeah. So they'll the the accessibility consultant will be brought in as a sub consultant under the design team contract. Okay, Bob. Bob has known me since I was able bodied. Things have changed, and I'm real focused on. Right. Okay. No, very high priority. Okay. You know, and you know, and you know, and as we got presentations from the design teams, they shared with us each of those experts in the various sub you know sub consultants or subcontractors that are going to help us make sure that we've got all of the right components so in place get around. that's right okay. that's right Thank you. yep so uh, today we're going to preview for you our recommendations for both design team and for construction manager at risk uh, we ran separate processes to select both had great interest uh, in both contracts and uh, think that we have been uh, been blessed with the opportunity to work uh, with the best both uh, locally and nationally on this project. So we've already talked about uh, Broadus and Associates and that contract was not approved on XXXXX, it was approved in November of 2021. Uh, Design team, on November 13th, you'll be considering a recommendation to, uh, to go to contract uh, with a partnership between TVS Design out of Atlanta, Georgia. They are considered the preeminent convention center design firm in the country. They are partnered locally with Bennett Partners, and Michael is here in the, in the audience today. Uh, he's ridden shotgun on this project for a long time and we're thrilled to have him as part of the, uh, the team going forward. So, uh, On construction manager at risk, again, uh, great competition uh, for this, uh, this contract. Uh, had seven proposals, had two teams that distinguished themselves uh, far and away from the others and were, uh, were subsequently interviewed. Our recommendation is to go with the, the joint venture uh, between Byrne, E.J. Smith, and Hunt. And, uh, and the, the concept of a joint venture where we have business equity firms that are partnered in a, in a primary contract on a project this big, that's big news for us. Uh, and we are, we are thrilled to have this team or the, have the opportunity to work with this team. Um, in terms of uh, folks who help the staff teams along the way, uh, most of these folks were pulled from the committee that Mayor Price organized in 2019, uh, and uh, so their, their, uh, their input was valuable to us, just as the input of the feedback group will be valuable to us going forward. Uh, we've talked about the composition of the, uh, 
of the uh, feedback group, and this, this list certainly may not be exhaustive, and look forward to your wisdom on this. Uh, next steps. Uh, so as we, we mentioned, uh, the design team recommendation will be in front of you on September 13th. Uh, we will be talking about the creation of the advisory committee and uh, starting to pull that group together in September. Um, depending on what our schedule looks like, we may be back to you uh, on the additional debt that we need for phase one by the end of the calendar year. Uh, we are not wed to that date. It really depends on where we are in the process. Um, and then with the with CMAR, uh, I think what our path forward is to is to bring you a recommendation uh, for your consideration, and then come back to you after uh, that decision, and probably in the December January timeframe will be at an initial guaranteed maximum price for this project, and then we can go to contract with CMAR. Uh, at this point, again, we believe phase one uh, can start in the second quarter of next year and end by the fourth quarter of 2025. If that has to slip, uh, it's not. I don't, we, see, we don't see that as problematic at this point. Questions? Questions or discussions for Michael or Bob that haven't been brought up already? I just have one question. Um, I know you mentioned possibly when we uh, do the commerce, uh, adding the hotel. Um, is there any discussion on adding parking? Yes, sir. I think, I think as uh, per Council Member Beck's observation that there's a lot going on in this corner of downtown, uh, parking is going to have to be part of the discussion. Uh, not necessarily in the scope of the expansion project, but we'll be talking about parking. Thank you, Michael. Thank you all very much. Thank, Thank you. you. One quick. Also, with regard to the Omni there in the street, uh, when the Omni's letting big events incoming, big events outgoing, uh, the street backs up. Is there traffic study there um, or concerns or opportunities I th to address I think we'll that? Be talking, we'll be talking about traffic and parking for the Omni as well. So and which along Robert those lines, here comes Robert to, Stern to, something to, say about to that, talk about right? the hotel, Omni Hotel expansion. Yeah, we, we've actually already initiated those conversations with Omni about their traffic impact. So that's something that's on the table. That's a, I feel like Mike kind of buried my lead already since he told you <laughs> pretty much everything about the project. But uh, we're going to talk about the uh, proposed expansion to uh, the Omni Hotel. Um, so for those that were on the council a few years ago, pre-pandemic, this was a project that was brought to the council back in 2020, approved by the council, and was uh, moving forward. So this is really the site uh, down here. So the site was a... Uh, acquisition of the TCC Mayo and Center, uh, and then about a half acre uh, property that's owned by the city fronting Lancaster. Uh, and so there's some uh, early design concepts of their all projects. You see the existing hotel here, the expansion uh, coming out there. Uh, back in 2020, the original proposed project was $174 million, 400 key expansion. Again, they had planned to close on the TCC property by the end of March. Uh, we have brought to council a proposal for a Chapter 380 Economic Development Agreement, which really consisted of $45 million in cash at completion of the project, uh, which was a combination of a $40 million bond issuance and $5 million from the Lancaster TIF. Uh, and obviously, as you can tell by the date of March 2020, once we got this approved, uh, the world changed, and so the entire project was uh, put on hold uh, and really forced full reconsideration uh, coming out of the pandemic. But I think as, as Bob and, and Mike both spoke to, uh, I, I think the fact that Omni is looking forward to bring this project back, uh, that they want to make this investment, I think that's just an indicator that the overall health of the market is, is strong and getting better. Uh, and so I think this will be a, a good addition to, uh, to our downtown area. The current proposed project uh, is about a $217 million project, uh, costs all in, and again, that's really just reflective of the increase in cost of constructions from 2020 to 2022. 
Uh, so we're still maintaining a 400 key expansion of the hotel. Uh, so basically that would create uh, just over a thousand room uh, property on two adjacent blocks, uh, minimum 50,000 square feet of meeting space, a refresh of the existing 600 room property, and then improvements to the surrounding landscape. And, and Omni is currently under contract with TCC for purchase of the Mayo and building uh, with a closing at the end of September. Uh, so said the uh, just in this another aerial of the project sites again you see the Omni the Mayo and Center uh, the uh, city parcel here and the uh, proposal that we're bringing forward today also includes the TCC parking lot uh, which is across the street and so why are we doing this now I, I think you really heard uh, the, the benefit of doing a project like this from Mike's earlier presentation uh, we have had a, a number of new hotel inventory being brought online in the market uh, projects like the Sinclair and the Kempton Harper, but primarily those are hotels in the two 250 room category. Uh, as Mike talked about, the Hunnan study spoke to the need for two 1,000 room uh, super tankers, and so this is the first of those super tankers that we could bring online, uh, and then this really allows us to enhance our ability to attract new and larger convention business. Uh, one thing that was really important to us was we revised these conversations with the Omni uh, was the engagement of Lancaster Avenue. So this was a, a real discussion point with them under the previous deal back in 2020, uh, where we wanted to have Lancaster really engaged and, and activated. And uh, Omni was, was interested in exploring that proposal, but we really didn't have any hard things to put on the table. And, and so our concern really as we began these discussions is the fact that city and the TIF has invested millions of dollars along Lancaster uh, really since the original project was brought forward, we had the TMP terminal uh, plaza and pedestrian uh, passage that is that is underway, uh, going to be underway. And so we wanted to make sure that uh, when this project developed that you weren't facing a wall when you were walking along Lancaster, that you really had a nice pedestrian access. And so as part of the overall development and activation, uh, Omni is going to be including space for a 15,000 square foot restaurant fronting Lancaster. Uh, so that would be have to be uh, approved by DDRB, obviously, but, but this really gives us an opportunity to activate that section and ensure that we have a nice walkable area continuing along Lancaster Avenue. So under the proposed expansion, uh, they would be spending uh, just over $200 million on the expansion of the hotel room itself, a uh, minimum of $127 million or so in hard costs. Again, that's 400 rooms in a separate tower, 50,000 square foot meeting space and the 15,000 square foot restaurant space space in Lancaster. Uh, they will uh, commit to a 15% hard and soft cost to our MWB contractors per our policy, and the required completion uh, for the project will be December 31st, 2026. And so, as you all know, we have an existing uh, agreement with Omni that will actually roll off uh, of the books and be completed uh, by the time that this project is, is finalized. So that's how we'll be able to utilize the existing hot, which we'll be talking about as far as the debt service, to fund, uh, fund the overall project. Uh, as part of this, they were also going to construct a new parking garage for the overall development. Uh, estimated cost about $6 million, so that will be on the uh, existing TCC parking lot now. So we'll take away that service parking, have a 200-space parking garage. Uh, Omni was going to convey that parking lot to the city upon purchase from TCC. They are going to be responsible for the construction, maintenance, and operations, so the city does not have any costs uh, in that garage. Uh, it will actually be owned by the CCLGC, so subsequent action uh, pending your decisions today and your uh, allowing us to move forward, uh, we would go to the CCLGC in September uh, to uh, have their approval for the, uh, for the garage component of the project. Uh, and this would be uh, provided to Omni with an option uh, to be really conveyed back to them uh, after a 10-year period. So our recommended incentives would be a, the one-time $53.3 million grant at completion. Uh, they would be delivered no later than 120 days following the project uh, completion and CFOs being presented. The CCLGC would issue the $53 million bond, uh, really backed by the hotel occupancy tax generated by the new 400 rooms that are being added and the additional 600 rooms would be coming uh, back to us uh, that the existing agreement will be uh, winding down. Uh, we would convey the uh, half-acre city property along Lancaster Avenue uh, with the purchase price provided back to the developer uh, as a 380 agreement. Uh, and then we would enter into the lease agreement with the option of purchase after 10 years for the TCC lot and the parking garage. 
Uh, here's just kind of a wrap up the overall summary. Uh, really won't go through a lot of these numbers, but I do want to point out this final number here. So as, as Mike was talking about uh, some of the ongoing projects uh, that, that they're working on, this project, this development will provide just over, just under $34 million of uh, new state hot to the project financing zone. And so that's really going to be helpful uh, as we have some of these additional projects coming online. And so the staff recommendation today would be to enter into economic development program agreement with Omni to provide the one-time cash grant, uh, engage in the public financing activities in support of really issuing the bonds, uh, accept the property now owned by TCC, uh, convey the property owned along Lancaster Avenue, and then enter into the lease agreement with option to purchase uh, with Omni. And I will answer any questions you may have. Any questions for Robert? No, very excited. Thank you very much, Robert. Okay. Thank you. Our next item is a briefing on ARPA funding proposal to reduce gun violence with Chief Neil Noakes, and I believe Leah King, and there's Leah. We on away. My good side. Mayor and Council, we thank you for your time today to talk about what I know you all realize is a very important topic. Um, Neil Noakes, Chief Ford PD. My partner over here is Leah King, President and CEO of United Way Tarrant County. I imagine one of the reasons people cling to their hates so stubbornly is because they sense once hate is gone, they will be forced to deal with pain. James Baldwin. I read that recently and it made me think of what we're doing here. Another word for pain in my book is trauma. A lot of the violence we're seeing across the country, and unfortunately we're seeing across Fort Worth and Tarrant County right now, involves a lot of unaddressed trauma by people as uh, Thomas Apt, uh, academic and writer, he wrote a book called Bleeding Out, addresses urban violence in America, he said we're dealing with young people who are caught up in cycles of violence they don't understand and don't even fully realize they're involved in. We're doing a lot of great work in the Ford Police Department. When I say we, I mean the men and women who are doing a job every single day to address gun violence from a policing perspective. But as I've said many times, we will not arrest our way out of crime. It will take partnerships with other city departments. It will take partnerships with other organizations. It will take partnerships with the community. What we plan to show today is the reason we believe this one second collaborative is the way to make that happen. And we call it the one second collaborative because it's a collaboration of like-minded people who understand that a one second decision can literally be the difference between life and death. I do not have a clicker. I'm gonna let you advance if you would please. When I first read this, I, I was dumbfounded According to the CDC, this is nationally speaking, gun violence is now the leading cause of deaths among teens. This happened in 2020. Gun violence is the leading cause of death for teens in America. That surpassed even motor vehicle accidents. Okay. So when we're looking at gun violence related deaths and injuries across the country, these are the numbers we've seen. So 2019, maybe more of a baseline pre-pandemic, but the national trend has been year over year an increase in violence. Unfortunately, what we're seeing is the same in Fort Worth and Tarrant County. You see the numbers in white, the larger numbers, 3,000 to 4,000, almost 5,000. And in Fort Worth, these are the deaths related to gun violence involving teens in Tarrant County that have gone up. This year for 2022, looks like we're matching 2021. We've got to bring those numbers down. We have a population of Fort Worth that makes up 18% of our population, 18% demographic. That is all of our African-American representation. When talking just about black youth in the city of Fort Worth, Look in Tarrant County, look across the country, 50% of the victims for gun violence. Absolutely unacceptable. 
to kind of give you an idea, you've already seen with the graph how those numbers have gone up. But since pre-pandemic numbers, teen shooting deaths have gone up almost 50%. Staggering numbers indeed. So what you're seeing here are shooting-related deaths in the city of Fort Worth from January of 2016 until June 30th of this year. You might see clusters in certain areas, and we do, but that covers every section of the city of Fort Worth. This is broken down according to our policing di districts, our six police divisions. Every division in the city of Fort Worth is affected. You'll see more in some areas and others, yes, but make no mistake, if left unchecked, these numbers unfortunately will grow, and it's all across the city. Mayor and Council, it's uh, good to be back. Leah King, uh, President and CEO of United Way of Tarrant County, and um, uh, it's my honor, as always, to be here with, with Chief Noakes, um, though it's a sobering topic. Uh, we did want to uh, bring some hard numbers to you, uh, not only in relation to people who are losing their lives, the trauma that the families are experiencing as a result of some of these actions, but some of the hard costs. Um, you need to understand, and, I, and I'm sure that you all do because many of these things fall to you from a financial responsibility, which means it falls to all of us as taxpayers. Um, there's some data before you that really breaks down you know, what it costs for a shooting death. And it's a really crude way to look at this because putting a number on something like this um, just doesn't seem right. But we know that there are actual hard costs that uh, are borne by the community, crime scene cleanup, hospitalization. Um, you think about you know, unpaid hospital bills, criminal justice, uh, all of the uh, back and forth through the court systems, incarceration. And that's for a death. And $700,000, $710,000 for a shooting. So if we back those slides up to the number that Chief just shared with you and did the math, um, so it's a big number. But if you looked at the extrapolated costs for family members and their suffering, there's no number that you can attribute to that. This data, by the, by the way, uh, is done by a third party organization. Uh, they, they manage these kinds of things. Uh, it's what they do as an organization. It's the National Institute for Criminal Justice Reform. Uh, these numbers are actually the, they did city of Dallas, right? So these are likely very, very similar uh, in terms of the actual cost that uh, we would experience here in Fort Worth. And just like Chief said, you know, every split second decision can't be recalled. <laughs> Sometimes it can be remedied, uh, but if we are doing what we need to do as, an, as, as, a, as a group of organizations, as a collaborative, then we truly are helping young people in particular move from those split second decisions that they may live to regret for, for the rest of their lives if they get to live and actually provide them with some tools and resources to help heal them and to help give them better options and better choices. So the one, one Second Collaborative is just that. It's a strategic and comprehensive effort to disrupt gu gun violence and gang activity among young adults and teens in very targeted zones across our community. If you had to break it down, uh, this is what the model kind of looks like. So it really is taking all of the um, advantages and experiences of a multitude of systems and organizations working together uh, with common goals and making sure that we are addressing exactly what the community needs. It's driven by data and it's using models that have been implemented across our country uh, for many, many years. Uh, the, the, the main model being from Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention. 
it helps us to establish scalable administration and coordination systems and communication systems across our county, and it makes, makes sure that we have measurable impact where it's needed most. These are the partners uh, and the types of organizations that uh, we would, uh, we've already heard from many of them that are uh, very interested in, in working together to address uh, this issue. Um, hospital systems, um, education systems, obviously workforce development, criminal justice, city and county uh, departments, uh, and on and on and on. Um, we know that in order to get this done, it's going to literally take every institution within the community to come together. And the good news for us is that we do live in Fort Worth and Tarrant County uh, and the personality uh, that you all know and see and, and participate in is one of action and of, of collaboration. And so we're pretty excited about uh, just the, the folks that have already reached out in anticipation uh, and to make it known that they are very interested in working together. I think it is very important for us to stress the fact that this is just not something that someone came up with on a whim. This is actually a proven model. Uh, many agencies across the country, law enforcement and otherwise, look to the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention in Washington, D.C., because they have a 20-year track record of improving communities' capacity to reduce violent crime. And let me say it again, improving the community's capacity to reduce violent crime. This isn't to improve our capacity. We're working with the community to empower them. They have a proven model. If you go back for just one second, thank you. Uh, developing strategies that tackle the root causes of gang violence. And they're known for coordinated, organized plans of action. Now, if you'll notice in the bottom here, one word you see frequently is community. It's about engaging with the community, find out in what, finding out what is important to the community, and getting community buy-in with the efforts we would undertake. So there are five core strategies, community, mobilization, opportunities provision, social intervention, suppression, and organizational change and development. So to break those down just a little bit, on the community mobilization, there's heavy community engagement and collaboration. Again, it's not us going into the community telling them what they need. It's working with the community to find out what they want to do. Opportunities provision, education, training, employment. You cannot go to a young person, tell them to stop doing something, and not give them an alternative. This provides that. Social intervention, outreach and access to provision of services for gang-involved youth and their families. This is holistic. Oftentimes, if there's a child involved in this cycle of violence, it's not just him or her. If we can affect that entire family, we affect the legacy and trajectory of that family. Suppression. When it comes to suppression, we're talking about policing, right? We're talking about community policing. But we're also talking about formal and informal social controls and accountability measures, which oftentimes come from the community. There may be a young man or a young lady who would listen to someone in the community before they would listen to someone in a uniform. Organizational change and development is where we talk about the policies that help us create the best modes of dealing with these resources and getting them out to the community. Next slide, please. And so on the core strategies, we're talking about the evidence-based strategies. Data collection and assessment is huge. I think if anyone has heard me speak, you know how much I rely on data and intelligence to make smart decisions rather than making emotional decisions. As far as the social intervention, we talked about the outreach and crisis intervention, community mobilization, and that's work with many agencies within the community, including grassroots organizations, providing opportunities for these youth, uh, reentry activities. It's very important for those who may have been incarcerated to be set up for success when they come out so they don't go right back in. Organizational capacity building to work with the groups that are in the community already doing good work but maybe there are several who are in their own silos that we need to bring together and work to grow their programs. And the, th the third party evaluation takes the subjectivity out of it. We have someone with a very objective outlook who can help evaluate these programs to make, we know, make sure we know what's working 
what's not, and what we should do better. And so there are some you know, very clear goals that would be established, and uh, you can see from you know, what we have on your screen, obviously the very first one is to reduce violent crime. Um, that is a given, and it's something that we have to do. But as Chief mentioned, uh, improving the capacity of community-based organizations is something that's critical. We know that there are a number of organizations that work and have a lot of experience within the community, and they do great work and get excellent results. They just don't have the ability to do as much as we need as a community. And so helping them to scale their, uh, th their capacity without breaking them, you know, the, the objective is to make sure that they're strengthened and their infrastructure is such that it allows them to focus on mission. And if sometimes if you're just you know, throwing money at something without providing that infrastructure, it makes it very difficult for an organization to, to one day uh, operate serving 1,000 people and another day expecting them to operate with 10,000 people and they don't have the internal infrastructure to be able to manage that. So we have to be sure that we're setting them up not only to uh, accomplish their mission but to do so without breaking the organizations. And that takes coordination, it takes collaboration, it takes support. Um, the steering committee would, would be members of the, uh, the, the partners, so faith-based organizations, law enforcement obviously, corrections, nonprofit organizations, hospital systems, uh, including uh, you know, some, many of our mental health providers and counselors, uh, definitely people from the communities. And we would expect and hope that you know, both the county that has already uh, moved forward with their portion of this and the city and other partners would come forward with their representatives to participate on that steering committee so that we can make sure that we're hearing the voices from across the community. Um, this is uh, not just research and data-driven, but that same information is used to evaluate. And so doing that evaluation on an annual basis allows corrections to happen without saying, seeing a, a mistake that might be happening to, to go on uh, unchecked. We have to have an objective third party come in, and that is something that is, um, you know, that is critical and crucial to, to, to this initiative. And from an implementation perspective, uh, making sure that we have the right organizations at the table so that as those folks come out, uh, particularly of incarceration, that we already have established housing and workforce, and those things are already set up in advance so that we don't have to have that person wonder and, and, and have time, which is often not a good thing. We need to have uh, a plan in place for them to, uh, to move into. These are just an example of the types of measurable impacts. Uh, the good news is that uh, there are a number of things that can be measured. It will be determined also by the organizations that apply for funding and that want to be par participants in this program. So whatever their core mission is, we will uh, they will come to the table and, and provide what their specific impact will be, and that's part of what the evaluation will, um, but at a minimum, it will be these types of things. Outreach engagement, so organizations that work directly on the streets will uh, obviously count the number of engagements that they have, the number of conflicts that they mediate, uh, whether or not they're referring to partner agencies and what that partner, what, the, what happened at the end, the, was there compliance on both the agency side but also on the individual side, uh, counseling hours, mediations, uh, how many people went from unemployed or under employment to a different type of job, uh, what's the recidivism rate and how is that improving, and, and frankly, how many people are participating, how many people are showing up in the community uh, and, and measuring those types of things. Um, United Way is proposing that we act as the lead agency and work in partnership uh, directly with the Fort Worth Police Department. And, uh, and I just want to share with you, because I think it's important to note, this is directly from the uh, OJJDP model, and it's what they say about lead agencies. Uh, and I'm going to read this verbatim for you. The lead agency in these multidisciplinary programs does not, does not assume control of the initiative, but instead provides an administrative framework to facilitate the work of the intervention team in the steering committee. No matter which agency assumes primary responsibility for this initiative, its credibility and influence within the community are directly correlated to the success of planning and implementation activities. So in other words, um, it's not easy, but we're not here to say this is what everybody does. We're actually here to provide supports for all of the institutions that will be part of this collaborative. 
And I want to walk you through because uh, I want to be sure that everybody has just a baseline understanding of United Way of Tarrant County and, uh, and why we uh, feel that we are the right lead agency. Um, we will be celebrating our centennial uh, in November of this year. This organization has been around for a number of years working uh, as, as a trusted advisor to many organizations, to many foundations, frankly to city and county government on, on a number of occasions. Uh, we are a capacity builder and a convener at the core of what we do each and every day. We do occasionally, this is uh, data that was done, a uh, third party that did some um, um, surveying for us, and, and, and we want to know who knows who we are, who knows what we do, do they find us trustworthy, et cetera. And, and so just sharing this information with you as well. How we do our work is, is pretty simple, and, and I like that we layered it on top of the model, uh, that, and, and it's really the model of success. For us, we operate very similarly to the way that uh, the chief and the, and the police department operate. Uh, when you see, we say identify, that means data. It is our job to do research uh, throughout the county to identify which organizations, excuse me, which zip codes are having issues and what specifically those issues are. That information gives us uh, exact details that we need on how to make informed recommendations on investments within the community. And so for the people that are kind enough to provide contributions to the organization, it tells us where they ought to be invested. That's why that data is so important to us. And ultimately, by working directly with these community-based organizations, uh, we then are able to vet them and make sure that they have the ability to meet the needs uh, that they say they will meet and then help measure their impact. And so it is a cycle that we follow uh, over and over and over again, and it's how we get our work done. Um, we are definitely positioned to work uh, alongside and support the mission of the police department, and we're going to do that in a number of ways, uh, but we feel like that we're already set up to do that because both of us are not only trusted within the community, but we have to continue building that trust, and we believe that we do that uh, better together by partnering with each other. Um, we exist to identify and invite organizations and individuals to come alongside and work with us. It's, uh, again, at the core of what we do. And the way that we do that as the funding comes in, uh, we work with volunteers to help identify and make recommendations on how resources are allocated. So our staff serves as the backbone, so we will structure and set up meetings and handle all of the logistics. But let's say we, are, uh, we have a pool of funding for uh, maternal health, then we will uh, solicit and invite in, uh, volunteers that work directly on maternal health. So they may be doctors or nurses, they may be doulas, they, you know, they could have some kind of affiliation with that subject. And they then review the applications that come in from the community-based organizations. They score them, they make recommendations as a group, and those recommendations for funding then go up to the board and the board approves them. So it's a very streamlined process, it's a very managed process, and it's how we handle all allocations, and this would be handled very much the same way. Um, the other thing that I wanted to mention just as an organization is that we have the benefit of managing uh, large scale uh, federal and state grants on a, on a regular basis. And so just as an organization, we are already structured and established. Uh, we already do a, a single audit, which is a requirement when you receive the, the level of government uh, funding that we do. And so that's just a natural part of what we already do. And it's part of our audit each and every year. All of those documents are available for anybody to see. They're on our website probably about the last 10 years worth. So it's very easy to, to, to look and see what we've done. Uh, and, and that is the, the, the gist of how and why we feel like we are uh, structured as an organization to be able to handle an initiative like this. Uh, we already work with partnerships. We already have the capacity internally to help support some of these smaller organizations. And you know, it is our goal to ensure that uh, these organizations are set up for success. So ultimately, at the end of the day, our children are getting healthier. And that's really the, you know, the core of what we're looking to do. We need to make sure our kids are safe. Uh, when we were here before, we had a request for consolidation between uh, the uh, Tarrant County uh, uh, ARPA request and the City of Fort Worth ARPA request. That's what you have before you. Uh, uh, whoops, I just did something not smart, which was I got myself out of that nice thing that said next. 
then this is Tarrant County and the City of Fort Worth. So we can talk through any of these, all of these. Um, but with that, I just want to say thank you. Uh, thank you to Chief, uh, first of all, for um, being willing to come along this journey and uh, allowing us to, um, to be right there at the side of, of, of the team. And uh, just thanks to all of you for giving us the opportunity to come forward and share the details of the initiative. And uh, we will welcome your questions. Thanks, Leah. Chief, questions from council? Anybody? Questions, comments? I'll, I'll open it up. Um, from an overview standpoint, I understand you know, what you're setting out to try to do. Um, from a mission standpoint, I'm supportive of it. Um, there were some details that I'm still trying to, you know, get a little more resolution, you know, on maybe from from a process standpoint. Okay, so you you touched on some of those aspects already. You would require, if council supportive of this, to to get funding from CCPD, right? Okay. So how would that work? I mean, you know, our board would consider the amount, perhaps authorize it. Step me through what happens after that. You know, in, in other words, who, you know, I mean, PD would obviously factor in very heavily in this, Chief. How are those, how is that allocation of dollars managed? And what kind of, I should put it, feedback? Or, 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 for lack of a better word, right now, what what kind of what kind of you know what kind of control do we have as a council? You know, in terms of feedback, if if say for example we, you know, I know you have a third party looking at it, evaluating it, but if we see something that, you know, we might have a question on, where where does our input come into this process? Does that make sense? I'm, I'm not sure I'm exactly following you. Well, I mean, if you hear, uh, are you saying if you hear of an, well, once an organization we write the that's... Check, I mean, once yeah. we, so to speak, once we write the check, then what? So go what back to that say? slide, Leah, if we talk about this a yeah. little bit on the, I don't, what, it's number 14. There we go. And you and I talked about this, and I talked about this with Chief also. The way I see the steering, or what I would like to see from the steering committee, I'll put it like that. Um, and where you see these large grant projects that you guys have administered before, is the steering committee is oftentimes um, responsible for the decisions in how those grants should be distributed and who should deserve those grants. And importantly, at the city of Fort Worth, local governments is at the table. Um, to Carlos's point, if there are opportunities to coordinate with CCPD funding or make sure this, this funding is gonna go towards this project, it doesn't need to be CCPD funded, all that coordination would happen at a steering committee level. I have to imagine that at some point, the steering committee, which is a lot of people, you'll, you'll identify a very select group of people that probably will not be eligible for funding. The city of Fort Worth is technically one of those entities, right? We're, we're providing the money. We need to be at the table. There are probably other people you could put that have some expertise here um, to help you make those grant decisions to make sure the right coordination is happening in the community. Yeah, exactly, and and it's when I was mentioning that you know it's important for um, the county to have uh, participation, for the city to have participation, because ultimately um, that's where that volunteer body comes in. It's that group, not our staff, that mm -hmm. makes the recommendations, because you guys are going to be the ones getting calls, getting emails. So I. You know, if, if I'm understanding uh, Councilman Flores correctly, if there's something that, you know, comes to his attention that he's concerned with, what's the mechanism to be able to make it known and what's the control that's in there? So the mechanism to make it known would be directly, um, if you see in the budget, there's a project director and that person is there to work directly with the steering committee. That is what one of their key responsibilities. And so that person would be you know, if you want to have, know exactly who that is, so that's who you would call. And that person would hear exactly what the concerns were, do that research, and then follow back up with you. If the concern was that there's an organization that, uh, you know, is either not meeting its objectives, um, it's really our staff's responsibility to be watching those. And the way that we do it with organizations that allocate uh, and receive funds from us right now, we have re regular reporting 
um, that they provide to us. And so it helps us to track, because the, the last thing we want is for someone not to meet the goals and objectives that they've signed up for. So it's not just a check's written and it's like, good luck, you know, hope you, hope you do okay. Um, because again, we're not trying to break the organizations, we want them to succeed. So they need some support from our staff to teach them about um, HR practices. And, I mean, some of these are literally running on a shoestring mm -hmm. from an administrative perspective, but they yield great results uh, on the street. And so we want to be sure that they're able to do both. And that's where our team comes in. We provide some of that backbone and back office support for them. And, uh, but ultimately, you know, they have to provide reporting into us. Typically, what we do is we have quarterly reporting from the organizations. Um, some of our grants require different um, uh, frequency. We try not to overburden them because, again, it's, it's, it's a lot. But quarterly is, is, is uh, pretty normal in terms of the reporting that they have to provide back to us. Okay. And, and thank you for that. Uh, you know, what Mayor said, uh, you know, connects the dots for me, you know, in terms of some, um, some structure of process you know, involved there. So, again, just to encapsulate that, steering committee would be the body within that body. Point of contact would be the program coordinator. That's who the CCPD board would interface with on, on matters like we're discussing. Correct, because that way you can assure that what is received from CCPD, let's say there's an organization that does 10 things, but the CCPD funding funds them for three, okay. right? The other seven, they apply for these funds. Right. Yeah. Right, there, that, that's how you and we would ensure that there's not overlap. Now, they, if there's an opportunity to scale something that is the same, they'd have to come back uh, to ensure that you know it's not a duplicate. That's why that those um, those metrics are so important to count specifically how many of these outreaches are you doing. So they already will have a track record for the most part of what they've been doing prior to receiving all this. So we have a benchmark of information from the organizations. So if we're scaling, then we know how you know what the delta ought to be between where they are today and and where they uh, say they would go through their application process. Okay. And again, I say board, you know, in, in reference to also individual members that may have, you know, their their own questions or, or need for clarification. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Right. Thank you. Gina. I have a couple of questions, but right now I'm just going to ask questions from my public. What happens here, Chief knows I'm getting emails from different people. So one question is, how do nonprofits get on the steering committee you know, for this initiative. And I'm gonna enhance that question by asking, what's the next step so that nonprofits could engage and have a say? And I'm gonna assume that'll be at CCPD. So. One, of, one of the things that Lee and I actually talked about at length about this okay. is when it comes to choosing who is on the steering committee, Obviously, if this is community focused, okay. we want input from the community and everyone around this table, with the exception of a couple, are elected by the very people we're trying to serve. We would lead heavily on recommendations you could make to us about members of the community who have the resources, who have the knowledge, who have the head and heart knowledge we need to get this done. So um, we, we would hope we would have that partnership with you as well. So I, I heard Carlos mention CCPD, but then I heard no to CCPD. What, what is the role for CCPD? So one of the things we have to make sure we're doing is not uh, double paying anyone. Make sure if someone's receiving uh, dollars from CCPD for providing a service, that we're keeping that separate from what we're doing with, with ARPA. And the CCPD board has got to be involved with that to make sure that we're making the right decisions with the right groups and the CCPD board has been great on making recommendations uh, for, for organizations that we can partner with that are trying to do the work we're doing to prevent crime. I seem like I confused you more than I helped you. No, there. no, no. I'm just time. trying to try task here. Yeah. <laughs> and, and Mayor Pro Tem Bivens, the other thing I would mention is I want to be sure that, that we're clear on because um, the, the semantics are really important. Mm -hmm. If there's a nonprofit organization that wants to apply for funding, they ought not try to get on the steering committee. Gotcha. Right? Well, this is, this, I think this is a good point. So, and I think Elizabeth may have the same thing. 
I think one really helpful thing might be a steering committee is very different from a funding committee. That's right. And I think you need two things. You need a steering committee that we're all welcome. We're going to give you 15 different examples each of people we think you need to contact, need to be at the table, and inform this process we're creating on who needs to be served. And then separately from that, you need a really robust funding committee. And I'll just say my request would be, a specific request would be, allowing this body to appoint one of us, mm -hmm. mayor or council member, onto that funding committee. And additionally, mm -hmm. the police department, whether it's the police chief, would be wonderful, or his designee. And then additionally, as an advisor, the CCPD staff member, in this case it's Keith, but it may change in the future, just inform making sure all those programs are the same. And for public listening, it's not all of CCPD. It's really our Partners with a Shared Mission initiative that we're talking about, the overlap, which is a small portion of the CCPD funding. So I do think there are opportunities where some of those same nonprofits may, may in end up with two different grants for two different programs, and that's okay if both bodies believe they're capable of that work. Yeah. That's my request. Elizabeth, you may have more to add to that. Yeah, no, I Kind of, yeah, I know. You kind of hit the nail on the head there. That's my concern, is that if you go back to the slide on the steering committee, um, and I know we've talked about it, and you kind of laid out the, the folks that you felt like were going to be members of that steering committee, um, and with the utmost respect to the leadership in our community, at our health organizations, our mental health organizations, our, you know, um, this feels like a, a bottom-up approach should be really examined in this. And so when we're talking about the steering committee, I think people who are from organizations or communities that are directly impacted by this violent crime should take precedent because, I, you know, I can't, I, I can speak to my personal experience. I can't speak to Chris's or Leonard's or Gina's or Jared's or, any, you know, anyone else. And so uh, no one knows our communities like the people that live in them. And I do think I'm glad Mayor brought up that suggestion because the community, the agencies that should really be receiving this funding um, should be also be on this steering committee, right? Because they're the people in there doing the lion's share of the work, and I don't want to opt anybody out because they're doing double duty. Um, and so I think that's my first comment. So thank you, Mayor, for that. Um, I, I did do some homework on this the past week. Um, and I noticed that um, Asheville has a very, is it Asheville? Let me look. I don't want to lie to you. Asheville or Richmond. Richmond. Richmond has one. I don't want to get in trouble with David over here using the wrong. Um, <laughs> um, and the one thing that I noticed about them is, so this particular pro project, you've come to the county for $1.9 million and us for $4.4 .4 million. Uh, that's a pretty hefty price tag. I mean, it's over $6 million to to get this together, and I heard you say that agencies have already reached out and, and have talked about how do I get involved, how do I participate in this. Um, what I saw in Richmond was that their funding sources were really diverse. It wasn't just the county or just the city, but it was a lot of partner organizations, and what that showed to me was buy-in, right? If I'm willing to give dollars, I'm going to put my money where my mouth is, which is a little... I think we haven't seen this in other budgets, so I have some concern that, you know, how we're, how we're doing this. But they put their money where their mouth was. They bought in. And so we knew, they knew that they would be a good partner because if I'm writing a $500,000 check or a million dollars, I'm going to be at that table. You can, you can bet. I'm sure you would for the same for your organization. So I would like to see what organizations have um, raised their hand and to what extent they've raised their hand and willing to put dollars have, have committed to giving dollars to this program? Um, let me say this. Uh, I don't want to put any of the organizations out um, for, for a number of reasons, um, but your point is, is, is not only a good one, but it's critical because if we're going to have the sustainability that this program has to have, um, there, there, there has to be a number of partners at the table. Um, what I will tell you is that this gives us um, some greater opportunities than the normal groups that tend to come to the table in our community. Uh, and, and, and for us as an organization, uh, gives us the ability to reach uh, outside of even the state to nationally based 
um, um, foundations that work specifically in this area. And so um, those, um, um, the, the, the interest level that, that I have shared with them at working together is there. Uh, they understand that uh, for, for those types of organizations, um, you know, everybody's saying the same thing, but differently. Uh, they're like, well, we wanna see local um, commitment. And then local commitment says, well, we wanna see other commitment. We, we get it, we, and, and that's exactly what the plan is for us. Um, we know this can't stop at 30 months because it took longer than 30 months to get into this situation. So, um, you know, our organization has already made some efforts at even bringing on uh, a staff member uh, that works four years, uh, starting with year four uh, and beyond and will make contact with, um, or reestablish contact that I've already made with some of these organizations, um, but particularly outside of this area. I'm not saying that we wouldn't be willing and open to working with local organizations, because I think that's important too, since they live here and their employees are here. Um, but I do also wanna take advantage of some of the nationally based organizations that we have um, not traditionally had access to. Chris. Yeah. I know Gina has some more things too. But I I just want to uh, jump in real quick. Um, so I think when you guys came back the last time, one of the statements that were made was we have organizations who have applied for CCPD funding and it, it was not enough funding to do what they needed to do. And this was going to be another mechanism of giving them funding. But now I'm hearing you say that if they apply for that funding, they cannot apply for this funding no, or no. vice versa. I'm sorry, uh, if, if I was confusing. Basically, we have a, a program that's already receiving CCPD funding. Say they have 10 employees. Mm -hmm. We're not gonna pay them again for those 10 employees. Now, if they want to add 10 employees, they can receive additional dollars to scale, to expand the program. But if they are planning on staying the same size, they are not expanding their reach, then obviously they can't receive funds to maintain what they are. These would help them expand the program to have a broader reach throughout the community. Okay, I have some. If you can pull the uh, the budget, the budget up. Which which one? Uh, the six million dollars. The, uh, the consolidated. Okay. There we go. Okay, and what? I mean, if you can kind of give a, I mean, I'm, I'm reading it, but um, are these different, okay, you have money selected in a prevention of activities and interventions and um, re-entry. And so are these mechanisms or buckets that individuals can go after that you have set aside? Yeah. And and your top tier, uh, your directors, can you kind of just walk through that? Sure. So us? the personnel would be the uh, the staff that we would hire in order to manage working directly with the community based organizations, the steering committee. So uh, one would be a program director. It's one full time employee. Uh, that salary is for 30 months, but at 70 percent. I'm sorry, this is 100 percent. This is the consolidated. Uh, and then two program coordinators uh, and a specific grant accountant. So, you know, as we all know, there are very specific uh, financial and compliance accounting requirements that we have. And so uh, not a full-time employee, that's a 0.10 FTE. Um, the contractual, so fringe and supplies, I think, is, is clear. Uh, the contractual would be the gun violence assessment. So that's the research, whether it's uh, the TCU, Rutgers, uh, expanding uh, and, and doing it for the entire county for uh, the 30 month period and the initiative evaluation. So it's what I mentioned that you have to have a third party group that comes in and evaluates the effectiveness of the overall program and whether or not it's meeting its goals. The next one would be um, legal and training. Uh, we have a system, a, a, database, a database that we want all of the organizations to use so that when we're measuring our success, we're actually talking the same language and we're able to pull reports the same way. Um, outreach workers are the organizations that have outreach workers that work on the ground. That would be uh, their bucket. 
the other would be just what you mentioned, so whether the organization works in prevention, intervention, and so on and so forth. Uh, the agency uh, direct, indirect cost would be to United Way, that would be 7.9% uh, of the total uh, to pay for our administrative uh, expenses to be able to uh, implement the program. Okay, I uh, appreciate that uh, breakdown. And I, I wanna revisit, um, I think go back to what the mayor and Carlos was talking about as we deal with the steering committee and the funding committee um, or board or whatever you're gonna call it. Um, because, I mean, I think it's important. I think it maybe should be one or two uh, because, again, this is quite a bit of funding that we're participating in. Um, we you kind of we kind of talked around the topic that there may be groups, and I think you kind of mentioned that may not have the structure, may not be ready to receive the type of funding that they're requesting, but you have training mechanism uh, set aside. Um, what are some of your qualifications or what would disqualify a person from being able to get funded? Um, it, it would be tough. So we, you, about you got three a years committee, ago, right? we do. So let me, let me share with you. Um, so w when I came in as CEO about uh, not quite three years ago, um, smaller organizations really had a difficult time applying for funding from United Way because they didn't necessarily have some of the structures in place that we require. And so what we, just, and what we, what we determined about that was that was an equity issue and it was really impacting communities of color that were not, that had smaller nonprofits, but they were unable to apply. Um, maybe their, their uh, grant application wasn't written as eloquently as someone else's, right? There's a number of things that um, were subjective, right? But that's, that's just how it was. So what we have done is we have taken um, the overall funding that comes into the organization and separated, uh, and there's a bucket for large organizations, so um, budgets, annual uh, budgets of $300,000 and above, and then we have another bucket of funding for organizations whose annual revenues don't exceed 300,000. Those are the ones that need a little bit more handholding. They need uh, to, they may not even have their 501c3. We apply for that for them. Uh, we help them with their bylaws and governance documents. It just depends on what the organization needs. And so what we've tried to do is to be more inclusive. And in doing so, we've gotten closer to communities that traditionally haven't been served by our organization directly. So, um, so this would be very much the same thing because the types of organizations that have the trust on the ground um, are not gonna be organizations big like ours, right? It's gonna be some of the smaller and mid-sized organizations that are working and speaking every day directly to um, the neighbors and to the people within the community. The goal would be for them to scale so much, they don't need to apply for as much funding because they've got their infrastructure in place they already, they're getting their audits, they're, they have regular board meetings, they have minutes, they would operate just like any other nonprofit entity that you would expect. So we don't expect everybody to come to the table to have that um, from day one. But we know that they can get there and they can get there with, and, and, we've, and we've helped a number of organizations do that. And I'll finish, and I, I know the, just the organization you just kind of mentioned, I know several now that don't have the infrastructure in place. And, have been terrified to apply for CCPD funding uh, because they doing the work physically, but on paper uh, may not have the organization skills to do that. And we will be doing ourselves a disservice if we continue to only fund organizations that are readily ready. And I, you didn't say I that. Agree. Right. Yeah. I and agree. so, um, yeah. That is going to be a real issue for me to make sure that we are getting the right folks to do the job. Yeah, I, I agree. And I would say uh, this, that the organizations that are already having success in those areas, and, and there are a number of them, like I said, some of them don't even have their 501c3. They can't even, if they receive funding, right, the donor doesn't get a tax benefit from it. Mm -hmm. We work with a number of organizations. In fact, we're fiscal sponsor and agent for dozens 
of entities that are going through the process of getting their official IRS designation. And it's our finance team that's actually helping walk in, walk them through the application. So you're right, we, we strongly agree. And that's why we made that change because there were just too many organizations that were not um, even coming to the table. And so you know, we made the change and then we also added to our team to, to have uh, someone in the community work directly with others to say, this is open to you now. Uh, if you felt, you know, I don't know if they got denied before, if they just didn't apply at all. But um, to understand, we bring them through bidders conferences and we walk them through the process. And so, um, you know, we, we want to be uh, there as um, hand-holding folks through the process as possible so that at the end of the day, they're focused on mission and then we, you know, and not focused on, well, how do I, uh, you know, write a 20-page grant application? We need them on the ground um, working with families and individuals. Thank you, Leah. Le Gina. I have a question for both of you, but because I have this horrible eye ache right now, I don't know what's going on, I'll ask both questions and try to get out and get some medication. Leah, I'm, I'm the whisperer, and you just used two words that I think you need to elaborate on. You mentioned fiscal uh, sponsor, and so if you could elaborate on what that means. And Chief, you weren't always on board with this idea. I want to know what is it that made you change your position, and I hope you can can communicate that. So, were those questions clear for both of y'all? Yes. yes. Okay. Um, quickly for us, if an organization does not have their 501c3 yet, but they are able and 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 they have a mission statement, sometimes they are volunteer run, um, they are receiving donations, and the um, donor expects not just that. Uh, that the um, that they would receive a tax receipt, um, but that also the the funds are expended appropriately, and so they utilize our organization. We open a separate bank account, and they send in their financials, and our team uh, runs through the financials, and we make write checks, uh, and so it's a check and balance for the donor to ensure that their money is being used as they expect. Uh, and then it also helps us walk the nonprofit through the process of getting their IRS designation. So for people who've been shady on their nonprofit status and using another one, you can help. Yeah, they don't have, yeah. <laughs> yes. I'm just putting it in English. I, I didn't know you all did that. Thank you. Now, Chief, have the turnaround, please help me out. Absolutely. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem, for that. I think it's an, it was an important evolution for me because I'll be honest, when I first heard of the program, the first thing I thought is, why is why somebody in my lane? Why is somebody in the police department's lane? This is our job. We're already working on this with TCU. We're developing a program. But then I thought, is that just my ego? Maybe I need to look at this because we need to be willing to get outside of ourselves and work with others, right? I read the program and said, wow, this is really good. I reached out to TCU. I had them read the, the uh, proposal. They said, this is exactly what we're working on. This, this is wonderful. I checked out things with the OJJDP, evidence-based. These things have worked across the country and they're absolutely critical. And I thought of the conversation I actually had with uh, oversight uh, police monitor, uh, Kim Neal. And she, I was talking with her about programs like this. She talked about one that she'd seen in Cincinnati and some others she'd seen across the country. And she said, Neal, you, you can't do this by yourself. You've got to get help. You need to focus on the law enforcement and let someone else focus on the community engagement for you work with the city leadership. And when I realized, when she said that, I realized, you know, she's right. We do need help. We need to make sure we're getting the resources we need to connect people with what they need. My biggest problem was finding a, an organization and a person I trusted. I didn't want to just go to someone from another part of the country to bring them here to learn what needs to happen in Fort Worth. I wanted somebody who was already invested in our communities, someone with a track record of helping our communities and not a fly-by-night organization. Not someone here who's here for a check, they're here to, to distribute checks. They're here to make sure the job is done right. I had never even seen this one slide. No matter which agency assumes primary responsibility for this initiative, its credibility and influence within the community are directly correlated to the success of planning and implementation of activities. I can think of an organization that's more credible, with more influence, 
in Fort Worth and in Tarrant County to do this job any better. And on a personal note, I can think of no one better than Lee King to help us be a part of the change that needs to happen in our communities. And when I sat down, thought about the entire program, thought about those that will be involved, I was in 100% and I still am. Any other questions, Council? Alan? So, uh, Chief Leah, I appreciate the time you spent with me the other day on this. Uh, we spoke about potential sustainability issues and, and general use of funding. So could you spend just a moment, because a lot of this budget is built on or is designed around building capacity during, during the first three years. There's a lot of training and, and build up and, and about half the money goes directly to, to, to deeds, to, to outreach workers and the specific activities. Uh, I, I really want to understand how that ratio shifts over time. Mm -hmm. And then also, you know, we talked about this being ARPA dollars. Are there constraints on the organizations that can receive these funds based on it being ARPA dollars? Yeah, the constraints would fall on the, uh, on the lead agency. Uh, so it would be our responsibility uh, from a reporting, from an uh, um, um, audit perspective, uh, which is why we have uh, the reporting from the organizations back so that, you know, we get real-time information back from them. Uh, and, and it allows, again, if you were doing it on a quarterly basis, it allows not too much time to go by uh, and, and, you know, potentially identify an issue that can be corrected. So, so that, this is something that we do. So I'll give you an example. Right now we have a, 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 a meeting going on in our office with um, some uh, uh, Older Americans Act funding uh, that the Area Agency on Aging received, and there's probably about a dozen partners at the table uh, for that, uh, and this is around food security for people 60 years of age and older. Uh, our, our objective is not just to say, okay, here's you, you wrote an, uh, an application, it got approved for this, and then go on your merry little way. We have to be communicating uh, on a regular basis, not just individually, so lead agency to, um, to the recipient, but all of them together, because this is a systematic issue. It's not just, you know, the, we, we have to stop doing the Band-Aid approach, which is what happens a lot of times when these organizations aren't coordinated. So, um, so, so the responsibility, again, comes back to us, which is why we bring these organizations around the table uh, on a regular basis and we go through training compliance. Over time, you're exactly right, the, uh, the, the, the training dollars do not have to maintain at the same rate unless you're totally turning over all of your organizations. And if that's happening, then there needs to be a complete time out something is broken, right? If all the organizations have to keep turning over, that's a problem. So either you're breaking them, you know, as I mentioned before, and you haven't given them the infrastructure that they need, uh, or th we're not managing them appropriately. So it's why we keep um, in close contact and have routine uh, discussions and meetings with them. Um, the other thing in terms of sustainability, uh, we, we agree, and it's why we have kind of accelerated uh, bringing on uh, a person to work specifically, which is not in this budget, by the way, uh, that it's just, uh, this, they will work on this, but this won't be the only thing that they work on uh, to, to ensure that we have the ability on year four, five, six, and beyond uh, to already have funding identified. Um, the research is gonna change. Uh, it's not gonna be the same, uh, so yeah, the evaluation will be the same uh, the rate, you know, if, if, we're, if we're fortunate to be able to uh, negotiate a multi-year rate, uh, we'll look into that. We typically like to do annual RFPs on that um, because it just sometimes gives you fresh eyes if you have different organizations look at it. And so, um, you know, these are the types of things also that the steering committee, they might say, well, no, we want you to use one institution for the next three years. Great, we'll do that. Um, will make our recommendation say, we recommend we do it on an annual basis and here's why, here's our experience. And we've done it both ways as, uh, as an organization so we can share our experience there too. Thanks, okay. Alan. Any other questions, Council? Go ahead, Chris. I had a few, uh, Mayor. Um, can you kind of give me, uh, explain what the amount for the steering committee, what, what does that make up of? The 276,000 for the steering committee? 
Um, so on the steering committee, we've got meetings, we've got legal, we have compliance, but there has to be MOUs that are established up front, and um, so that's what that is. So that's a, again, that's a 30, that's a 30 month expense. Okay, and so from the conversation, I think you say a couple of organizations reached out to you, and then just the whole makeup and the model that you guys are, uh, are presenting today, I see again prevention, intervention, suppression, reentry jobs, support services. Um, those are four different things I think that directly go into the community. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay. Um, with gun violence, this is driven from gun violence, this initiative. Mm -hmm. Is correct? Just to prevent and stop gun violence. Correct. Okay. Um, what have we heard or seen of how reentry, and I'm just asking the question, reentry jobs, training, support services impact or prevents uh, gun violence? One thing, if, I'm, if I may. Please. Yeah. Um, that I talked about earlier, it's one thing to go to, let's say, a young man who's involved in this cycle of violence and tell them, okay, you need to stop. It's another thing to give them options. Uh, we have, and I'm not making excuses for the cho cho uh, choices others make, but there are some who know a certain way of making a living and providing for themselves, providing for their families. We can't tell them to stop if those are illegal activities and not give them an alternative. Give them something that will empower them to be able to actually go out and take care of themselves and take care of their families. We see there are often roadblocks for those who are coming from being incarcerated back into the community, maybe trouble finding housing, maybe trouble finding a job. We want to do everything we can to make sure we're removing those barriers and helping them actually be successful because if they're not, there's a chance they fall back into the old ways that got them in trouble in the first place, and oftentimes that involves gun violence. Okay, and the, the point, uh, point I'm uh, bringing up, because I know even in the CCP funding, when you look at the, the breakdown of, we give to child cares and day cares and after school programs, which I completely support all of that. Um, I want to make sure that our main focus, if, if this is something that we're doing and it's, it's centered around gun violence, I don't want us to drift off to these other initiatives or other supports that's not directly going to affect or stop the violence of gun use. Um, and, and that's kind of why I kind of asked the question about reentry. And there's some others I want to ask, but I won't go into detail on all of them. But I want to make sure that everything, the, the bucket of money outside of what we have to do to support staff needs to be driven to stop and end gun violence. Absolutely, that's got to be the focus, and that's why that third-party evaluation is so important. So we have someone that looks at it and is telling us what is working, directly related to gun violence. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Council. Any other questions? Okay. I think with that, the the main reasoning for bringing this presentation forward was one: there were lots of questions around the table, both from the last presentation and in, in separate meetings. Two, it's a sizable amount of money. We've already gone over that. Thank you for the consolidated budget, Leah. So the proposal around this table really is for our, our input to city management. You don't have to do it right now, but to give clarity for to United Way and to Chief on green lighting this to come to an MNC at council in the next several weeks. Um, There's not necessarily a rush to do that, but I think that's our next decision. So um, go ahead, Gina. I'd just like to state for the record, I want to make sure we are in communication with groups such as United Fort Worth and Community Frontline and others that come through so that the information is shared with, with the public that we know will have a vested interest. Thank you. Um, so I think for right now, um, this is exactly what I think most people needed. If you have more questions, um, get, get with David. I think other, unless I'm hearing any negativity back from this body, then our plan would be to proceed at council um, and an official MNC, you can take your vote. And additional comments from the community may happen there um, from the dais um, in a public setting as well. Sound good? Sounds good. Okay, Absolutely. thank you very much. Thank you for thank your you. time. Okay, Council, one more. Um, it's an update on your short-term rental data mining registration zoning options with Dana Bergdorf. Thank you, Dana. Um, I might start this conversation by reminding us we're not going to make any decisions today. So... For obvious reasons, this is a this is a really tough topic, and all of you have lots of input and have studied it separately and have constituencies that are talking to you. I know I do. 
So what I'd suggest is we allow Dana to present her information here today, ask the questions necessary, and then come back together. Because I just don't think between now and 6 o'clock um, any decisions need to be made. We've had plenty of time to talk about this. We need to get this right, um, and I don't think speed is in our favor. So that's my opinion as you kind of think about Dana's presentation today. Okay? All right. Thank you, Mayor. Does anybody want to stand and stretch, do some <laughs> calisthenics? Okay, yeah. <laughs> I do. <laughs> thank you all for the time. I appreciate it. I uh, know this is coming uh, late in the day. I do want to thank uh, several departments, communications and public engagement, finance, code compliance, development services, law. I'm probably forgetting someone, everybody who's been involved in uh, this conversation. Yeah, <laughs> there's a lot, a lot to, lot to cover. So, um, as I meant, as uh, Mayor mentioned, we are going to touch on policy questions for council. Um, I do want to share with you the presentation that we gave to the public uh, in early July and uh, visited with them in late July at a couple of public meetings, um, but also bring you some new information that we've gathered um, since early July. So again, what is a short-term rental? We're just talking about rental that occurs for less than 30 days. Um, if you're thinking about a booking night, that's technically two days, so you could say 28 nights or 29 days, um, but that's a short-term rental. We want to make sure that's clear because some uh, folks want to do rental for 30 days or more, and that's perfectly fine uh, in our residential zoning. We're just concerned about short-term rental in uh, residential zoning that's less than 30 days. So current regulations and locations, uh, as we've talked about before, we allow short-term rental by right in all of our mixed-use zoning and most of our form-based code districts, commercial zoning, industrial zoning, uh, typically requires a certificate of occupancy from our development services department, and then it's not allowed in the, the residential zoning districts that we have, and uh, the alphabet uh, soup is listed there for you. Um, and then with regard to enforcement, uh, as with all of our occupancy enforcement, it's done on a complaint basis, uh, when, when violations are observed, then uh, code can issue warnings and citations to property owners. Um, the city cannot currently issue citations or warnings um, based on short-term rental advertisements alone um, or other online bookings. So they have to actually prove that the short-term rental occurred, that payment was made, that it was less than 30 days, and so on. Uh, in, in FY21, we shared with everyone in early July that there were 71 cases uh, requiring 278 inspections, and I'll provide you some updated information for fiscal year 22. This is the map we shared showing in green the areas where short-term rentals allowed, and then in gray where it's, where it's not currently allowed. Uh, and then again, just as a reminder on hotel occupancy tax, short-term rentals are required by state law and city ordinance to pay hot. Uh, we levy 9% for the Culture and Tourism Fund. We're not able to use those dollars for any kind of in, uh, enforcement of short-term rental uh, zoning ordinances or other ordinances, um, but we can use those funds to promote tourism, convention, and hotel industries. Currently, HOT is self-reported on our, on our city online reporting tool or, tool or hotel app. The short-term rentals report on a voluntary basis that's not monitored currently by finance, and that's one of the uh, issues that we'd like to address. So here's some uh, new information. We thought this would be of interest to help show you um, the uh, geographic uh, spread of where short-term rental activity um, is occurring, at least with regard to code compliance cases. So these are uh, complaints that code has received. You'll see in purple is the new FY22 year-to-date information. Uh, we're more than double the number of cases in FY22 uh, to date that we had in FY21. You'll see the, the purple popping up around the stockyards uh, and some other places out west uh, that we didn't see in prior years, and thanks to code uh, for this information. So these are just reported zoning violations uh, where code would have issued a notice of violation uh, to those property owners after they'd performed those inspections. So um, you all have received the uh, short-term rental report. I won't go into all of the details here, but this was uh, the data mining firm that we hired, Deckard. Uh, through, through the finance department to look at short-term rental information. As you may know or may not know, the uh, advertising platforms do not share addresses with cities, uh, and they've gone to court to uh, defend their right not to have to do that. So the data mining firms have to go in and try to pull the advertisements and figure out where the properties are. And so they'll, they'll have a small radius uh, that you can generally pull from the sites, uh, so they have some... Um, 
autonomous or, or computer uh, programming that they do to try to figure out where the sites are, and then they've got people who have to go in and try to street verify. They look at photographs, they look at names, hosts, owners, other locational information to uh, try to hone in on uh, where the short-term rentals really are. So they've address identified 2,453 um, uh, listings that, uh, that are for Fort Worth. So that's about 89% of all the listings that they've been able to uh, address verify. Um, and then of those, there are about 814 actual sites uh, that operated as a short-term rental at some point within the last year. So that shows you that there's uh, about three times as many advertisements as there are properties. And so that give, uh, is, par is partly related to the number of platforms that folks can advertise on. Also, there are uh, folks who might be advertising in different ways, right? Some might be advertising a part of their home or a, a garage apartment or something else, and so, but it's still the same uh, property. So this shows you, uh, at least with those that are uh, currently operating within the, within the last month, there were about, I think it was 600 and, um, 614 or 613 uh, operating. Most of those are in residential zoning districts and are therefore not allowed. 68 that, that are allowed today. Uh, here's some information on the, over the past year, the number of nights that are booked. Uh, we were curious to see what the level of intensity is in the city in terms of individual properties. And you can see there's quite a range. 42% um, were booked 30 nights or fewer uh, over the course of the year. And I point that out because that relates to one of the zoning options uh, where we said maybe fewer than 30 nights a year uh, would be more of an accessory use uh, to the property um, and uh, where you don't have the, the STR use every weekend, but just say 15 weekends at most a year or four weeks a year. Um, but there were a small number, 8%, uh, that were booked for over 150 nights. So that's um, much of the year. Yes, so I uh, want to re remind you of our goals um, and policy options, but then also new information, uh, share with you just a summary of the public feedback. And again, thanks to communications and public engagement for getting that report out to you earlier today. So again, these are the six goals uh, that we've had uh, shared with you in June and have shared with the public this summer. Uh, and then just a reminder that we consulted with the National League of Cities to, uh, to see if there were some um, policies that other cities were using to help achieve these goals. Uh, permit, requiring a permit, requiring registration. There seems to be broad consensus um, that we should do that and that that's common practice in other, in other cities. Um, that we should consider requiring host residency or owner occupancy in, in residential areas since most complaints come from non-owner occupied units. Uh, that we should restrict density if we are going to allow uh, short-term rentals in a particular residential neighborhood or geographic area, and then dedicate resources to enforcement. So these are the draft um, operating standards for, for legal short-term rentals that we've put together. And so there's really two questions. One will be, should we just require registration for short-term rentals irrespective of operating standards? And we would argue yes. It's required by state law, required by city code. Uh, they should register with the city and pay their hot. Um, so that's something that, that we would recommend. But separate from the registration or in addition to the registration for legal short-term rentals is we've identified a listing of operating standards that we would recommend and have shared with the public uh, for those who do to choose to register. Number one, that they would pay an annual fee to cover their costs for the platform and enforcement. They would, of course, pay their hot. Uh, that the property owner would register or consent to that uh, registration that that wouldn't be transferable to another owner, they would, that, that new owner would have to register. They'd be a 24-7 local contact, have liability insurance, safety protocols, just one guest or group at a time, uh, limiting to three people per bedroom, max of nine people, that comes from our uh, bed, and, bed and breakfast ordinance. Um, On-site parking only to prevent uh, on-street parking. Uh, no events or parties, no outdoor gatherings or music after 10, require a good neighbor guide, um, and then have the ability for code to uh, place a registration on probation or revoke it based on violations, which is similar to what we do now for multifamily uh, registration citywide. So these are the proposed operating standards. Uh, again, this is a policy question for council on whether to impose any or all of these operating standards. And real quickly, Dana, just for clarification, yes, that is for legal STRs. Yes, for legal STRs. Thank you. Yes, thank you. So the um, uh, we, we've we as staff would, would not recommend allowing a, a short-term rental that's not legal 
uh, to register with the city because it gives them a confusing status uh, with the city. That are they legal? Are they not legal? So we would only recommend a registration for legal short-term rentals or those that can become legal through a zoning action. So in addition to the operating standards for the owners or, or, uh, and hosts for short-term rental, um, we would require registration uh, for properties that advertise for short-term rental. So this is really the big help for code compliance, where they have to do multiple inspections today to determine that short-term rental activity actually occurred. Having an ordinance that requires folks to register if they advertise, whether they perform the short-term rental or not, whether they book or not, that that would enable code to more easily address the illegal short-term rental activity. So that's, a, that's a, an important one for staff. Uh, then next, uh, you may have received emails about platform accountability uh, for folks who are asking you to ensure platform accountability. So this is the idea that the city would require the advertising platforms, Airbnb, VRBO, um, to only allow advertising for short-term rentals that are registered with the city. So to both be able to um, uh, work with the advertising platforms to make sure folks aren't advertising if they're not registered, and then similarly to have the ordinance so that if we see any advertisements, whether through these major uh, advertising platforms or in other uh, media, that we would be able to um, ask folks to register. And then lastly, requiring a certificate of occupancy when the uh, short-term rental is not a primary residence, um, but really rather a commercial lodging. And so again, that's we would apply the bed and breakfast building and fire code requirements. So switching to zoning, um, we reviewed zoning in other cities, not every city, but, but a number of cities. Most of them differentiate a primary residence or owner-occupied short-term rental from an investor-owned short-term rental. And then most require a zoning change or a conditional use permit for investor-owned short-term rentals to operate in single-family districts. Some do allow it by right, but, but many do not. And so that's consistent with the National League of Cities guidance. So here's the... Um, the table indicating some cities in Texas that have addressed short-term rental uh, and then other cities outside of Texas. Uh, you'll see um, that most of them in that first column differentiate primary residents or owner-occupied from investor-owned. Um, you'll see Denver's listed there. Denver's been brought up a number of times because of their platform accountability language. Uh, next, you can see the, uh, there's a, not as many, but, but again, most require a zoning change or CUP for investor-owned short-term rental in single-family zoning. Uh, a few also limit density, and then Arlington is the unique one um, that limits short-term rentals uh, based on a specific geographic scope around their entertainment district. Okay, so options for addressing illegal short-term rentals. These are the four options that we shared with the public in early July and, and briefed them on throughout the, the last several weeks. So uh, staff identified the four zoning options. One of the criticisms we heard was that Staff didn't consult with others before coming up with the options, but it was a little bit of a chicken and egg because we wanted to have options for them to react to. Uh, and council did ask us in June to get public input on those options before coming back to council, which we did. Um, none of the four options would allow short-term rental uh, as, the, as the primary use of residential property um, by right within the residential zoning, meaning where the short-term rental is the primary use um, much of the year. So we, we're not recommending that as a buy right option. And then um, just to, for folks who may not know that the zoning change process and the conditional use permit process are basically the same and both require public hearings and votes by zoning commission and council. So first option is to retain the current ordinance. Just as a reminder, uh, again, we don't allow the short term rental in residential zoning. So if you want to have that use, you would need to pursue a zoning change, uh, perhaps to a PD, a plan development for say A5 plus short term rental uh, or perhaps even rezone to a mixed use or commercial zoning, which might make sense if you're near one of those uh, zoning districts. So that's option one. Um, and again, I should, I should emphasize for all of these options, staff is recommending registration and operating standards. So even if we don't change the zoning ordinance, we would recommend the, the registration and, uh, and operating standards. So uh, option two would be to treat the short-term rentals like bed and breakfasts. Owner occupied would be a bed and breakfast home. Um, Investor owned would be a bed and breakfast in. Um, currently with our bed and breakfast ordinance, we do not allow the conditional use permit option uh, within single family zoning. So within single family zoning, 
if an owner wanted to do short-term rental under option two, they would still need to change their, their, their base zoning. Oops, excuse me. Option three is a little bit more permissive. So this would be to allow that conditional use permit option in all residential districts. We would suggest a density limit, although again, because it's a conditional use permit and case by case, um, that would be discretionary. Uh, and then option four would be the one option that would allow uh, some short-term rental by right, but in very limited circumstances, um, which would be uh, to have the density limit and to have fewer than 30 booking nights uh, per year so that it's not uh, the majority use during the year. Uh, and then require a conditional use permit or zoning change for all others. So those are the four options that were presented. Obviously, the city council has the option to you know, come up with something more permissive or combine or, or modify any of these options. So public engagement, just a real quick summary. Again, there's a lot more information that Renee and his and Michelle have shared with you, uh, but we had over 12,000 page views on our website. Over 3,600 folks responded to the feedback form on the options. Um, most support option one, but there was a strong diversity of, of opinions, as you would imagine. Uh, the thought exchange prompted uh, 391 individuals to submit uh, their ideas or thoughts in writing. Uh, and then there were, um, gosh, almost, almost 30,000 folks who rated um, all of those ideas and thoughts. And then um, uh, we, again, had the two public meetings in late July, 44 speakers, and then 70 uh, questions at our Q&A session. Um, so again, thank you to the team for, uh, for that feedback. And I know you all are receiving uh, emails as well. So policy questions. So number one, so put these together. Uh, num should we require short-term rentals to register and pay hot? Arguably, this isn't really a policy question, again, because it's required by ordinance, but we wanted to pose it to you that way um, since it's not, uh, we're not really enforcing that today. Should we require it uh, going forward is the first part of that. And then um, if we do re require registration, uh, should we require uh, any or all of the proposed operating standards as a condition of registration uh, for short-term rentals, uh, again, with that advertising platform accountability included? Can, so will you just explain how hot taxes, uh, how the hot works, just so there's clarification on what we can do with it and what we can't? And then I have a follow-up question. Certainly. So in terms of the registration, so... Um, Hotels, motels, and short-term rentals that, that you know, are legal and have registered, they pay their hot monthly, and so it's 9% of their uh, revenues. Um, and so yeah. the, yeah, so the, the idea would be, uh, in terms of requiring short-term rentals to register, we would just notify the ones that we've identified uh, that are legally operating, reach out to them uh, once we have that, um, that new advertising platform ready to go. Uh, not advertising, so sorry. Registration uh, platform ready to go. So finance is working to bring on a firm that will give us a more modern, user-friendly uh, interface. So there's two potential revenue sources from this registration process. Regi the actual, the act, the cost of registering, whatever that right. cost is, and right. then those folks will have to pay the hot, our hotel occupancy Correct. tax. Now, we have limits on what we can do with that revenue. Specific, with the hot. Right. Mm -hmm. And so what are those limits? So they can be used for um, tourism and convention-related activities. Uh, they could not be used to um, pay for, say, code enforcement officers or uh, zoning, you know, change staff. <laughs> and they don't <laughs> go into our general fund, right? Like, we, don't, we can't use them for sidewalk improvement. Correct, correct. Correct. Okay. So it goes into the yeah culture okay. and tourism fund. And then, so, uh, is that, did I say that right? Yes. Yeah. And so then I have a question about how that works um, with our our appraisal district and how we um, how we identify those because, and I don't know how rental properties work, but if if they're paying the hot tax, does that make them a commercial property? And not so that we've seen tax differently. Yeah, not that we've seen. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so it, there, there may be, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, there may be. But so for example, um, say the ones that are legal that are maybe operating um, in mixed use zoning or, or other zoning, um, if it's a single family home, it's still listed as A1 as the state land use code, just because a lot of times it's based on the structure um, and how it appears to be operating. And, so and that, that becomes, you know, that's a challenge too. If you think of like 
some of our um, home occupations, right, where we allow some limited home occupations. It's still an A1 single family or a, I forget the, was it C for multifamily? Um, that those are still the, the state land use codes that they appraise off of. As I and Elizabeth, it. I think one of the things you might be saying, any rentals or leases over 30 days, those are not considered commercial either. Those Correct. are still residential use. Correct. Yeah. Yep. Yep, that's right. Okay, so this is the, the first set. And then the next, next is, should we consider any of the zoning options uh, or other options for addressing the illegal short-term rentals? And then lastly, should code, should code continue to enforce only the nuisance violations in response to short-term rental complaints, or should they address all illegal short-term rentals for zoning violations in response to complaints? So one of the things that they've done over the last several months is, is they knew that council was gonna be looking at zoning options and de determining how to address short-term rentals. Uh, they've generally been providing notices of violation when they get a complaint for a short-term rental, but haven't been issuing citations uh, for the short-term rental unless there's some other accompanying nuisance, you know, trash violation or noise or, or other problem. Mm -hmm. Carlos. Dana, um, as far as the online survey results, I had inquired prior uh, to ensuring integrity in those responses. Did our analytics reveal anything in that regard? So the, yeah, so we, we, we tried not to call it a survey or a poll or anything else because we weren't trying to limit the number of people or what ISP, you know, what, I'm not ISP, right. the, um, the computer <laughs> uh, server or that they used. So um, there were, um, I think the vast majority of comments were for option one, uh, which was the, you know, leaving the zoning ordinance as it is. Um, but I wouldn't want to rely on it and say, well, X percent are for zoning you know, option one and Y for zoning option two, because we also had a lot of input from the public meetings, from emails, the thought exchange, and so on. So sort of taking it collectively, um, okay. the majority were, were so, in favor so of option really one. Don't, but, and it, yeah, yeah, really don't in as far as what we collected online, but I understand what you're saying. Looking at it comprehensively, you would say if one was weighted heavily in some regard, yeah. it would balance out given the totality of the responses. Yeah, in the totality, the, the, the majority of what we heard was in favor of option one. But again, there's strong voices who are also in favor of, uh, particularly from the Short-Term Rental Alliance and others who are in favor of us doing something that's uh, more permissive and doesn't require a, a base zoning change in order to have short-term rental use. All right, thank you. Leonard. Uh, just on the survey, um, is there a way to tell, um, I've had this question come up, um, participants that, uh, where they come from, if they were in town or out of town? So yeah, so we they, they were able to select the zip code or to say they didn't reside in Fort Worth. And I think there were something like 8%, and I may be confusing the thought exchange participation versus the policy options, but I think maybe 8% were outside Fort Worth, and so the vast majority who responded were in Fort Worth. Um, there were a lot from 76107 as an example, but there were, gosh, a number of zip codes that were selected. It wasn't, you know, just heavily, just a few, for example. Yeah, yeah. So the full report that Renee sent you has all of that data. Gina. I don't know if you, if you showed this in the demographics, but I tend to get more complaints from older citizens, like, you know, folk my age, mm -hmm. than the younger and so were we able to capture any age demographics? I don't believe we asked for age, um, but you can sometimes just see that in terms of folks when you when they comment at, at meetings. Okay. <laughs> so but I don't think we I don't believe we asked for any demographics. Yeah, yeah, visible split in age. Okay. Yeah, for so the I'm not imagining that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. So this is a hard topic, as I said earlier. I think these are the right policy questions, Dana. Thank you so much for such a thorough presentation and how much hard work you and staff have put into this point. Um, I would suggest, and I want council to jump in and interject, that you communicate directly with Dana on any other policy questions you feel like are not up here. Um, take the presentation and the data provided, um, both in the, in the research as well as the communication, the engagement uh, information that came out, read through it, and talk to Dana about it as well, what's missing. 
And then I think we need to come back in the next several weeks into the public on what our timeline really looks like um, and what, and what because I think this is going to generate, I know it did for me today, a lot more questions than answers. And I think we'll probably need to dedicate a lot more time to this. So if that makes sense to everybody around this table, talk to Dana, give her questions to you individually, continue to get input from community members and neighborhoods. Um, and then we'll communicate to the public on what a proposed timeline might be for any changes. Michael. I just want to underscore what you said. We are not voting anytime soon on this yes. at this point. Yeah. So there's a lot of, I think, uh, misnomers in the public that we're about to do something with this and vote on it. I think there's, uh, as you've said too, we need more time. we got a budget we got to get done. We've got other things that are taking priority for the city, taking our time in this part-time job. That's full time. Uh, <laughs> so I want to reiterate that this is not something that is tomorrow we're going to vote, next week, something like that. Right. So well everybody said. hear that. Yeah, well said. Anybody else? No. Thank you, Dana, Thank very you much. I appreciate, appreciate the time. You. Okay. Okay, council, any future agenda items that are burning on your mind? Or are you ready for a break? Yeah. You got something? I got one. Normally, you got Good. a list. So I just want to make sure. Oh. I, I do have one. Michael, go ahead. <laughs> um, I know we're revamping and looking at our boards and commission process, and what I, we get updates. Uh, I know PDCs when those are going, building standards commission. We get um, our zoning, obviously, because we're going to vote on that. I know urban design commission. There's, I, I would, I'd like to know what, and I don't know if this needs to be a formal, formal IR or not. That's not what I'm asking for. What are we getting notices on, and what are we not? Because there are things recently in my district that popped up and it was an urban design, but I didn't know anything about it. I, I, like with building standards, et cetera, there's not much we can do. City Plan Commission, there's not much we can do, but being informed helps so we're not flat-footed and surprised. So I'd like to know which, which ones we're not getting on notification when they meet, uh, because I look through the building standards to see what's in my district. I look through um, the other ones. And so anyway, I think you get the point of that request. Thanks, Michael. Gina and Jared. Uh, my question involves the new city hall uh, presentation. I got a question online asking if parking would be free. And I figured because we were so remote that it would be. That's a hint. But I do want to make sure we get that addressed in the next presentation as soon as possible. Thanks, Gina. Jared and then Elizabeth. Thanks, Mayor. Um, David and I talked about this by email, um, but I just want to connect to public record dots for the neighborhood uh, NQRC. Um, in our meeting, we had came up with a future agenda to bring to the council about summer programming. Michael brought it up earlier related to our community centers, and we just wanted to look at, you know, what are the calls for programs at community center, whether they're summer or during the year or after school, um, in preparation for a budget conversation to see what additional supports we could provide for our kids and families. Thanks, Jared. And then Elizabeth. Yeah, as um, we go into finalizing the budget, um, I think it would be prudent for us to make sure that I know we part of that package is making sure that we're paying a competitive um, salary. And so I'd like to know um, a breakdown of, of you know, percentage of salary under $15 an hour, 15 and above, like I'll let staff kind of figure out what they feel like those break points are. I'd like them to be um, tied to cost of living. So just so we make sure we're doing right by them when we finalize the budget. Sounds good. Okay. Yes, Chris. Oh, I, I had mentioned this a, a month ago, but I don't know if I need to take the lead. I guess we can talk offline about it, but trying to set up a meeting with, uh, the ISD leadership with cities, with us, uh, ISD leadership and the uh, city council. I think we talked about it a couple of weeks ago, so. Okay, good. Okay, yeah, meeting we, adjourned. What? Yep. Don't forget, we, we had talked about all of the ISDs that we touch, you know, including Crowley as well. And yes. so if Chris is okay with that, I'd like to make sure we have that as well. Because we provide, crawl, wherever we wherever we touch, H E B I S D and Crowley I S D, and we tried to get that before Betsy left, but just never did. But there's a reason to bring them all together. Okay. Okay. With that, meeting adjourned. We'll see y'all at six.